All right? Yeah, that well, looks graceful. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to call this meeting of the Climate Initiatives Task Force to order. Today is Wednesday, March 9th, 2022. Uh, Ms. Kinchin, will you please call the roll? Yes. Chairman Vorhoff? Here. Mr. Moses? Here. Mr. Haas? Here. Mr. Lambert? Here. Secretary Harris? Here. Ms. Higgins? Here. Mr. Bro? Here. Dr. Calaboda? Here. Ms. Bush? Here. Mr. Hardy? Mr. Robertson? Mr. Gray? Mr. Bowser? Mr. Borg? Ms. Burkett? Ms. Gotro? Mr. Daniels? Mr. Chambers? Here. Mr. Swartz? Ms. Pichon Battle? Chief Dardar? Mr. Verchik? Ms. Manning Broom? Right you have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Kitchen. Well, th today is the, the 50th public meeting of the Governor's Climate Initiative. Uh, 50 meetings taking place over the course of about 16 months. But this is the first meeting since we unanimously approved the state's first climate action plan, which was delivered to Governor Edwards on February 1st. This is the first meeting where we are shifting our focus from planning to implementation. And we continue our work under the direction and leadership of Governor John Bell Edwards, who directed us to deliver a balanced suite of recommendations to get us to net zero by 2050, but also to strengthen our economy, improve our quality of life at the same time. So we are privileged to have Governor Edwards here today to share his thoughts on the climate action plan that was delivered to him last month and share his vision for taking climate action moving forward. So I'll ask you all to join me in welcoming Governor John Bell Edwards. Thank you all and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. And it is, it is great to be on the backside of all the meetings to come up with the plan and now to actually be talking about a plan that, that has specific strategies and, and actions. Um, and I looked at the agenda today, and, and uh, you all are going to discuss some, some extremely important uh, topics. And, and uh, just wanted to start off by telling you how much I appreciate your efforts. Uh, you've worked, obviously, across the aisle, uh, across industries, areas of expertise. Um, and I know that these, these uh, deliberations, these decisions have not been easy. Uh, and I know that because I've read the plan you gave me uh, and and all of the strategies, all of the actions, and I read through uh, the dissents as, as well. Um, I do appreciate the fact that people were able to come together, understand that they had differences of opinion, register those differences of opinion, but still move forward uh, with the whole um, of, of the report. And so I, I, I do thank you all. Uh, Today's meeting is centered around implementation, and certainly we're still ramping up. But I'm excited for you to hear about some areas where we've already begun to take action uh, and to prepare uh, for some exciting opportunities that we're going to have. Um, with respect to what this action plan means for the state and for me and my administration, um, I think too many people uh, – undervalue the importance of having a concrete plan in hand um, and those all-important first steps. Uh, and and I, I will uh, illustrate it this way. In 2007, we developed a coastal master plan. There wasn't a single project. There was not one dollar available. But today we have the most robust plan of its kind anywhere in the world. We are investing more than a billion dollars a year. And I believe that, that um, 
know, we're going to succeed over the 50-year uh, life cycle of, of that initial coastal restoration mesh plan effort of delivering $50 billion worth of restoration and protection for Louisiana. Um, so if you wait until everything is figured out, the funding is in hand, the projects are all concrete, guess what? You'll never, ever, ever get started. So the work that you've done is incredibly important uh, for our state. Uh, like the master plan for coastal restoration and protection, the climate action plan that you put forward provides direction and priorities for the whole state as we steer away from disaster and towards a brighter future. Uh, it is the guidebook for how we as a state are going to make big investments, seek new funding opportunities, pursue new programs and partnerships. And we can't know in 2022 what new advances there will be in technology uh, and other advances between now and 2050 that we can take advantage of. Um, but we know that having this plan to guide our efforts uh, and to organize us is going to be very important uh, as we take advantage of every opportunity that comes our way. You should know that for the past two days, uh, not just my cabinet, but an awful lot of folks from the state of Louisiana across uh, the executive branch, but but also uh, private sector folks and 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 um, uh, I, I should say other folks uh, from around the country really uh, came together in New Orleans to strategize around the opportunities presented in the Trillion Dollar Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act or the IIJA. Um, this really is a generational opportunity, and, and that may be putting it mildly because I don't know the next time it's going to come. And, uh, but, but this is a rare opportunity to invest in our state, but also make good on the commitments in the clean, I'm sorry, in the climate action plan. And I made very clear uh, to all of the folks who were there uh, that our climate action plan is going to drive the way we approach the IIJA to a very large degree. Um, and this is really important because these are our strategies, these are our uh, uh, targeted actions, and we're committed to execution. This is a funding opportunity to actually deliver on that, and so it's really important for us. But secondly, there's a symbiotic relationship between our Climate Action Plan and the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act because one of the lenses that's going to guide the decision-making about who wins competitive grant uh, funding will be climate change. And our state is more impacted by climate change than any other state in the country, both from sea level rise and uh, storms and increasing frequency and severity. You all know that. But also, on the other side of that, uh, we are doing more than any other state in, in terms of climate change adaptation. We just talked about the Coastal Restoration and Master Plan. In addition to that, we're one of uh, not too many states with an actual climate action plan to achieve a net zero goal by 2050. There are none other in the Gulf South. So for all these reasons, Having a climate action plan will help us to compete for the dollars that were going to be available in the IIJA, which in turn help us execute on those actions. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly uh, important, uh, and I thank you all for it. So this is uh, an opportunity to move full, uh, full speed ahead on so many fronts, electrical vehicle charging, public transit, uh, plugging orphaned wells and prioritizing that uh, by an effort to reduce methane emissions, for example. Um, weatherizing homes, cleaner, safer, more climate-ready infrastructure across the entire state. Um, I also want to advance our climate action plan uh, through the authorities that my administration already has. Uh, so we're in the process of looking across the departments to understand where we uh, can bring the climate plan to fruition and where we need additional authority to do so. And this includes DEQ, DNR, LED, DOTD, and really all of the other agencies on the task force and across the administration uh, because we have to all be responsible for aligning our actions with the goals and strategies established in the plan. 
Uh, between aggressively pursuing funding opportunities to invest in our low carbon future and aligning my administration's policies and rules, we're going to do everything that we can, uh, everything in our power to implement the plan that you all have come up with. Um, we all know, however, that the effort we're embarking on to become a net zero state by 2050 will take commitments from partners outside of the governor's office. Um, you know, I don't have the authority to direct things that are exclusively in the province of the jurisdiction of the Public Service Commission or the legislature, but we do have a plan that points everybody uh, in, in what I believe is the right direction where we have to head to collectively. But beyond that, it was a plan that was created with input, not just from my administration, but from all those people, the Public Service Commission, the Commissioner of Agriculture and Forestry, appointees from the Senate, uh, president and the Speaker of the House, uh, and also stakeholders from the private sector. Uh, so it's my hope that their active participation in the plan's creation means that they too view it as their plan. And to that end, I want to formally endorse the specific goals mentioned throughout the climate action plans that will reach across sectors and levels of government, but nonetheless capture the right scale and pace of the ambition so that by 2030, Louisiana should be retrofitting 5% of residential and commercial buildings each year, uh, aim to conserve 30% of our interior natural lands, increase transmission capacity for clean energy by 30%, provide 1,000 megawatts of energy storage, and reduce fugitive methane emissions by 30%. By 2035, we should produce 5 gigawatts of energy from offshore wind, transition 50% of public fleets to low and zero emission vehicles and fuels, and double alternative modes of transportation. And by 2050, uh, we will have doubled our capacity for clean energy transmission and act a clean industry standard and shifted all public fleets to low and zero emissions vehicles. Um, again, the governor of Louisiana, whether it's me or future governor, doesn't have the sole authority or jurisdiction to deliver on these goals. Success will require cooperation across state government as well as cooperation of local and federal government uh, and I believe the plan that we have is balanced, uh, and therefore it can be successful. Um, look, we, we do pursue an all-of-the-above approach. And I think it's the all-of-the-above approach that gave rise to some of the dissents, because some things are more attractive to people than others. Uh, but I believe we have to do it all if we're going to be successful. And having a balanced approach is the only way to be successful in a state such as ours that is a traditional energy state, an oil and gas state, which we will be for a very long time, but in decreasing amounts. And I know it's kind of strange to say that right now when we're all trying to increase production and get more, get more gas into the pipeline so we can reduce costs. Uh, but the long-term trends are not going to change, and the market is not going to change its views overall. So this transition is underway, and quite frankly, it's going to be driven more by the private sector than the public sector, and that, that is already happening. So to be successful, we're going to need champions, we're going to need advocates, we need engineers, we need educators. Um, if you're on the task force or following along in the public, we need you to engage in your community. It's that engagement that's going to sustain the initiative over the coming decades and across administrations. And, you know, there's so many parts to the plan. Um, if there's some part that you don't like, focus on the part that you do. I'm not asking you to do anything that gives you a personal heartburn. There's so much in there that, that you can embrace and wor work on that if, if that helps. But we're going to have to continue our work to steer the ship in a new direction to build support for the plan and for the transformation that it promises. Uh, we're going to have to develop new technologies, find ways to change the way we do business, and all of this does take time, and it's hard work. Change brings anxiety. I get it. But this change is going to happen whether we try to shape it or not. And we have an opportunity to shape it so that it's much more transformational in a positive way for us and for future generations. Um, and this is not all about the climate, which is really, really important. It's also about investment, economic development, and job creation going forward. 
Uh, I mentioned it a while ago, the world market has turned, and I hear this from CEOs all the time. Private sector commitments um, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing their carbon footprints are driving decisions by the CEOs of the largest corporations around the world and here in the United States because their boards of directors have charged them with that. They have to deliver. And so, for example, if they're making a decision about whether they're going to expand a facility they already own in Louisiana or build a new one here, it's very important that they, at least at some point in the near future, have electricity generated by wind or by solar. Otherwise, they can't deliver on those commitments that they're being held responsible for. And if they can't do that in Louisiana, they're going to take those dollars to other states. And that's where the investment in the job creation is going to be. And eventually, uh, we, we will be losing out. But that's not the way it's going to be because we do have this plan and because we are going to be committed to it. And we're going to make sure that those things are available here. And in fact, for all the reasons that I mentioned, there's not a more attractive place in the Gulf South for people to deploy their capital today if they're trying to make a transformational change around the climate because they know we welcome it. And they know that we are the only state in the nation where industry contributes more than half of the CO2 emissions. Everywhere else, it's power generation. So we have opportunities here that just don't exist elsewhere. And again, we're the state that's most burdened by the climate change that, that's being experienced. Um, so make no mistake success begets success and that success is going to play out in many ways that we can't even envision today uh, we have opportunities in front of us to realize uh, true successes in the near term the midterm and in the long term uh, that we can measure in dollars invested in reduced emissions in the pursuit of a healthier and more equitable and inclusive economy and we are just getting started so let's continue to work together to make this plan a reality and know that I will do whatever I can uh, every single day that I'm governor to advance this cause. It is just the right thing to do for our state. Uh, and I thank you all very much for the part that you're playing in it and that you're going to continue to play. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm done. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for your for your leadership. And as, as the saying goes, we you plan the work and then work the plan. And so we got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving to the next underwhelming uh, agenda item: approval of the minutes. <laughs> Okay, we have a motion uh, by Mr. Daniels. Is there a second? A uh, second by Ms. Manning Broom. Any public comment? Any discussion? All in favor say aye. No. Aye. Any opposed, nay? All right, we've approved the minutes. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are transitioning from planning to implementation. And so uh, we, we wanted to put together an agenda of just to demonstrate all of the things that are ongoing today, uh, and then we will uh, continue to lay out kind of what the the coming months and and, and years really look like uh, later on this agenda. So we will start uh, as, as the governor mentioned. Uh, IIJA is uh, an important component of of implementation of this climate action plan, and so we have Jackson Wright uh, with the governor's office to to share an, an update on uh, the state's work towards the IIJA. So thank you, Jackson. And as we get started, Jackson is the Director of Special Projects in the Governor's Office and has really been tasked uh, to, to coordinate across uh, the Governor's administration to, to, uh, on IIJA. And uh, I will also just add, ask that the record reflect that uh, Mr. Bowser, uh, Mr. Gray, um, sorry, I'm just, oh, Mr. Daniels also came in uh, and are present here today. All right, the floor is yours, Jackson. Thank you, uh, and thank you, thank you to all all of you for asking me to be here to uh, present about the 
IIJA, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. As the chair mentioned, my name is Jackson Wright. I'm the director of special projects in the governor's office, um, as well as the infrastructure implementation coordinator, which I'll, I'll, I'll turn to in a little bit. Um, and I w just want to say at the start that the governor mentioned quite eloquently that the IIJA uh, could provide uh, funding for many of the actions in the Climate Action Plan, but also that the Climate Action Plan itself really helps Louisiana be competitive um, in, in many of the IIJ programs. So I'll start just by giving a very broad overview. Um, $1.2 trillion Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA, otherwise known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, otherwise known as um, EJA, IEJA, Bill, um, <laughs> it became law in, in November of last year, and it, it really it really does provide billions of dollars in opportunity for, for Louisiana across um, many different federal agencies and, and hundreds of grant programs. And so just one way of, of looking at this, and this is from Brookings uh, Institute, their federal infrastructure hub, which you can see online. It's actually an interactive um, visualization. But the, the vast majority of, of the funds, according to Brookings estimate, you'll notice it's less than $1.2 trillion. That has to do with the continuing resolution that's happening right now. But um, you'll notice the vast majority is, is transportation. Um, and then energy, broadband, water are, are the other the other big ones that you see there. And this, this information comes from federal funds information for states. Um, it's a slightly different estimate, but um, you can see that in this case, this, this shows that the blue uh, on the bar graph is, is new funding, new dollars that have never existed before, and then green being existing dollars. And, and what this shows is that most of the funds are, are for existing transportation programs. But I want to point out that there are some significant new programs uh, within transportation, but also you can see that $48 billion um, under the uh, commerce is actually broadband. Um, and uh, within energy, there's a significant amount of new funding, and that's for clean energy. Um, and the significant amount of funds that are new for existing programs. Uh, and then environment as well is, is where you see the, the water um, money. Another way of breaking this down, and this also comes from federal funds information for states, the, the, the pie chart on the, on the left shows the number of grant programs that are funded. So you can see there are more competitive grant programs in the IIJA than there are formula. But the overwhelming amount of funds are formula dollars. That being said, um, the competitive, I mean, you look at the, the right pie chart, I don't know how easy it is to see, but it's $179 billion in competitive opportunities. Um, just want a billion, yeah, just want to stress that part. Is even though it's less than the formula, it's still a lot. Um, with the match, there, I just want to flag this too. There are some match considerations. Uh, all these new funds are going to come with some kind of non-federal match that's going to have to be put up by state or local, whoever's receiving the, the award. Um, and there are cases where the federal government is allowing for funding to go up to 100%. Um, so we'll have to pay attention to that guidance as it comes out. And the governor touched on this as well, but the White House has repeatedly defined four core priorities that cut across all of the different discretionary and competitive programs um, and even in some of the modifications to formula uh, programs. And, and those four things are climate change, equity, workforce or labor, and made in America. Um, and made in America is in reference to their Buy America, Build America provisions. Um, climate change piece, I mean, I just want to reiterate this. The, the Climate Action Plan will help us, help Louisiana be competitive um, because they are, they are re really evaluating um, these applications um, along these four criteria across, across all 179 billion of those competitive programs. The last thing that I'll say is just on coordination. Um, 
So the Biden administration created an infrastructure implementation task force. The president appointed Mitch Landrieu as the infrastructure implementation coordinator across the federal agencies and with state and local governments. So Mitch Landrieu wrote a letter to all the governors asking them to identify uh, infrastructure implementation coordinators within their office, and that that is my role. Um, and then they also the letter also recommended to identify those folks within all the relevant agencies. And so that um, structure is being set up now um, and been in contact with many of you, I think, one on one and in, in groups uh, who are in this room um, and excited to, to, to be working in the coordination on, on this really important um, opportunity. Just want to give one example and a, and a shout out, I guess, on coordination as well with, uh, with respect to this task force. Um, Lindsay, I don't know if she's in the room, but she worked with me to take the guide, White House guidebook of all of these programs, which is on build.gov. It's a huge document. And she went through each one and mapped them to the different actions and strategies in the climate action plan. So, you know, that's a good place to start in terms of connecting those two things, and I think just an example of where the coordination can continue to go. So um, thank you. That's that's all I have for this presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any, whatever time we have. Thank you. Any questions uh, for Mr. Wright? Mr. Daniels. Great. Nice to meet you, Mr. Wright. Thanks for the presentation. On an ongoing basis, what's a good way for us to engage with your office as you begin to roll out your strategies and think about partnerships that might help, um, ways of identifying additional resources, and and also meeting the new standards that are going to be attached to the funding? And uh, to your point about Ms. Burke, there are some others of us who have experience with those things. We'd love to be a partner if there's anything we could do to help. No, that's a, um, that's a great question. Thank you for that. I think... Um, you know, I think I, the the chair definitely has my contact information, yeah. and we can get that to you. And I think that's a great we're we're that's part of that coordination that we're standing up right now. Um, but right. would would love to, to to chat. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. And and Jackson, can you just talk uh, a little bit about for the competitive grants? It's a some uh, need need to come from the state, and then others could be from all sorts of different entities. And just can you speak to sort of maybe that breakdown and uh, the the value of partnerships uh, and the like? Uh, just kind of to riff off of Mr. Daniels' question. Yes, um, it's a great question. I don't have the a, a, a slide with the breakdown, and but there are you know many of the programs have a variety of eligible applicants to these so it could be state local tribal entities that could apply um, in some cases nonprofits or um, what is described as industry partners but so private sector um, in fact and then in some it really is driven by the industry partners themselves and particularly in the clean energy um, space so it might it would be something where we would want to think about the role that the state would have perhaps in coordinating but ultimately it would be up to that entity that's not the state to to apply for and receive those funds great question thank you any other questions from our task force uh, one more time all right all right, Mr. Haas. Good, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And Jackson, thanks for the for the information. I I, I know, um, and I don't want to steal any Miss Manning Broom's thunder. I know she's going to be speaking about uh, the activities over the last couple of days. But one of the things that that is evident before even the last couple of days is that there are a lot of uncertainties still with some of these funding streams. So can you just speak a little bit to to you know what we might know and when? <laughs> I'll, try, I'll do my best. Um, so the first, I mean, the first layer of uncertainty is that um, Congress has yet to to pass a, a budget for mm -hmm. fiscal year 22, and so we're while we're in a continuing resolution, it does hamper some of the 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 ability to be certain around funding levels for a variety of the formula programs that are um, in the in the law. Um, in addition to that, 
the newer programs, particularly the competitive ones, um, guidance has yet to come out from for the majority, the overwhelming majority of those. Um, if you look at the White House guidebook, if you're curious about a particular program, for example, they have a column in the guidebook or a section in the guidebook that um, is called the next program milestone that'll tell you that they update every week, actually, and they have been surprisingly updating it every week. Um, and it is, um, you know, for example, you'll know that the there'll be guidance released in quarter two or quarter three of this year. Maybe it won't be until 2023. So you can start to build out a timeline of when we're going to be certain about these. But I would say it's going to be a while before we know everything about all the programs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Any other questions from our task force members? All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again for having me. All right. Uh, next on our agenda, uh, we will dive a little bit more into the IJA workshop that's already been discussed. Uh, Camille manning Broom from CPEX, would you like to just uh, provide an update from, from your seat? Yeah, oh, okay. and um, I didn't provide a PowerPoint or anything, so I'll just Thank go you. off the cuff. Uh, well, interestingly, about a third of us have been together uh, over the past three days um, diving into the opportunities for Louisiana within the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, we came together to uh, look at uh, how, how is the state going to prioritize uh, what, you know, familiarize ourselves with all the opportunities, uh, but also what are we going to need to do to build a competitive advantage? And so uh, in a series of uh, activities uh, and, and a lot of hard work uh, over the last uh, Monday and Tuesday, uh, we really rolled up our sleeves and um, built out a series of priorities, but also uh, some meaningful and deep understanding on uh, some things that the state's going to need to do uh, to, to be able to seize the moment uh, for transformational change in this once-in-a-generation, uh, multi-generation opportunity with the amount of resources that are on the table. And I would just like to, to make sure that you all know in the room um, when I met with the governor to um, begin designing the agenda and the activities that we would go through, um, without a doubt, he said, we are leading with the climate action plan. And so everything that we did over those two days, that workshop, all the discussions were, uh, were based on the climate action plan. And, and so this was a climate first workshop. Uh, and so it was just really, really great uh, for everyone to come together uh, and, and get a game plan moving forward. Uh, we also focused heavily on equity and what that means and how we need to uh, design our projects uh, with thinking about equity and disadvantaged populations and what that impact uh, of, of lifting those areas up uh, looks like in project design. Uh, also around labor and um, the importance of uh, liv livable wages and, and even though we don't have unions uh, uh, supporting uh, entities that do uh, and, and because that is what the Biden infrastructure uh, or the Biden administration is looking for. And so, um, and then the, the fourth point, point that um, um, Jackson also made around uh, Buy in America. And so uh, on the second day of our workshop, we had a federal panel uh, zooming in, Mitch Landrieu, Acting Director Shalonda Young, uh, and another, a, a lot of other individuals um, from the federal agencies, and, and they said quite clearly, um, everything has got to advance climate, it's got to advance equity, it's got to advance labor, uh, and it's got to advance buy in America. And so that, those are our four pillars and our metrics that we're going to need to um, put forth in our applications. Did I miss anything? Jackson, Harry, Tom, Mark, anyone? No, but I'll just no. say that I thought it was a, a productive couple days. Um, we really got to uh, kind of focus exclusively on one topic, of, uh, an expansive topic of, of IIJA, but mm -hmm. um, to really focus in and, and get coordinated across uh, the administration. So uh, 
thank you for uh, helping to facilitate that those two days Camille all right any questions on just the workshop itself very good moving right along uh, next agenda item the h2 the future proposal uh, we have Anthony Bowden with Geno Inc Thank you, Chairman Warhoff, uh, and thank you to the committee for inviting me here to talk about the H to the Future proposal, um, which is a, a competitive proposal for an EDA grant. And I'd like to take a few minutes to walk you through um, the program itself um, and, and our proposal, our concept for it. But let me begin by, by thanking the governor, um, you, Chairman Warhoff, Secretary Harris, and Dep Deputy Secretary Lambert for for your agencies, your support uh, and advice all throughout this process. It's been an accelerated process, so I appreciated all of your, your staff's um, reception and, and, um, and work on this. Um, let's see. So the American Rescue Plan uh, delivered a Build Back Better um, program run by the Department of Commerce EDA, not to be confused with the Build Back Better a bill that did not um, pass Congress. This is um, uh, ARP money uh, provided through, uh, through EDA. And, and EDA put together a plan for billion dollar grants and really challenged communities all throughout the country to come up with transformational cluster strategies that would see the communities come out of the COVID crisis uh, stronger with more job potential. Um, so it was a competitive process that was launched last year. Uh, EDA received 530 applicants uh, and proposals, of which um, they chose 60. And we're glad to say that Louisiana received two phase two applications. So we have uh, the H to the Future as well as a proposal from the New Orleans region on biomedical uh, innovation. And in, in the Southeast region, I'm glad to say that we're actually the only one in the in the energy space and so now we're in the process of, of uh, filling out the phase two portion of this application um, for a deadline of March 15th and the total sum is between 25 to 100 million dollars um, of an EDA grant so the concept for H to the, uh, to the future is to position South Louisiana um, in the the future of green hydrogen production deployment and end use. And the, the crux of the application is around using offshore wind as a power generation, uh, employing the Louisiana industrial base as a customer, and thereby diversifying the economy. And I want to stress that this is perfectly aligned with the Climate Action Plan, both in terms of the 5 gigawatt offshore wind uh, goal, as well as uh, using the industrial base uh, in the hydrogen economy and looking at not just uh, existing uses but new uses of our energy capabilities uh, in the future. For those of you who are not familiar with, with what's going on in, in the hydrogen economy, it's really quite fascinating and this graph I think depicts the, the concept and, and really the opportunity here. Hydrogen is, is already um, abundant and well implemented in our energy base. In fact, you know, we're one, uh, one of the states that produces and consumes 30% of the overall hydrogen market. Now, our hydrogen market is focused on uh, the petrochemical sector, ammonia and fertilizers. But people are now looking at hydrogen as, as a diversification strategy because there are plenty of other sectors, many of which are listed here that cannot rely just purely on electrification. They have to look at different sources of green energy to, to diversify their processes, including 
um, airlines, uh, long haul trucking, uh, energy storage. Because of the drop in the price of electricity and renewables, hydrogen, which has already been a well proven technology in, in the uh, electrolysis process, is now becoming very popular. Uh, and the overall growth, as we're depicting here on this chart, if you can make out the color, so what you're seeing is uh, uh, this, this green bar on the top is the green hydrogen demand as uh, is expected to grow by 2050. Uh, the blue is the demand for blue hydrogen, and the lower bar is, is gray hydrogen. And what I would like to point out is not just the scale of the demand for green hydrogen, but the, the allocation of the different colors. And that's why we focus this application not just on hydrogen, pure and simple, but on green hydrogen in particular. So as I mentioned, Louisiana has a particular uh, advantage and particular strength, and that's really to the, goes to the core of what the EDA is looking for. They're looking for applications that can take advantage of um, just innate advantages, uh, innate competitive advantages for the diversification of the economy. And so that's what we're telling uh, our partners, the Department of Commerce, is that 30% of the hydrogen is already here. And when you think that the hydrogen economy is going to be um, based on overall scale, not just the technology, uh, there is an inherent um, first mover advantage for Louisiana in this space. So the, the application, um, the narrative of our application follows a pretty straightforward um, um, structure. We're saying that without major intervention in uh, our energy space, and this is where I think the Climate Action Plan is perfectly clear line again, uh, we would see a gradual decline in our energy economy. So something needs to be done. Um, at the same time, we have this huge opportunity around green hydrogen and, and the market is going to grow from there, both in the production of uh, renewable power as well as, as some of the end use cases. Um, we already have an industrial base that will take advantage of that. Um, and with specific and intentional investments from the EDA through this program, we can actually accelerate and make South Louisiana green energy hydrogen hub. Um, so to overcome some of these challenges and to overcome um, the, the structural challenges in putting together these large scale projects, we're pitching the, um, a series of projects that would be funded through this EDA grant if we're successful. I'll give you a, a quick description of the different work streams here. And, and, and what's important to point out is that the work streams are structured around three um, outcomes and three objectives. One, of course, is to retain as much as possible our existing energy workforce. Two is to diversify into uh, new energy jobs uh, and, and bring on new talent pipeline um, and have them stay in the state. And third is around um, discussions of equity, uh, both for disenfranchised populations, uh, displaced workers, um, as well as, as rural populations, and to make that a common theme throughout all the projects that we're pitching. And so I'll, I'll go from, from my left um, to the right. We've got a, a workforce uh, work stream that is a partnership with the Louisiana uh, Community and Technical College System where they would develop new programs in, um, at their technical and community schools to train workers around hydrogen economies, around wind and solar technicians. Uh, two is the H2 Business Development Program. Because this coalition is an economic development coalition, we're also bringing in the five uh, regional economic organizations around South Louisiana and partnering with them in making sure that the globe knows what is going on in Louisiana, what our objectives are, thereby att attracting additional investments, as well as looking at our existing uh, business base and making sure they're aware how they can either complement their existing services or, or pivot into new services more geared towards renewable energy. The H2 Test Beds is a partnership with um, three research universities um, the, uh, ULL, I love Lafayette, LSU, obviously, and UNO, each with um, specific 
research and development uh, opportunities and, and expansions of their, of their testing capabilities um, that would produce new engineering talent as well as new intellectual property that hopefully we can commercialize and turn to new startups. Um, on to that, H2 Testbed, we're also partnering with Nichols. Uh, Nichols is, is probably most well known for training offshore wind, offshore oil and gas workers. And now we're adding an additional curriculum that would train workers for offshore wind. Um, the H2 Nexus is, um, as you may be familiar, the, the innovation district concept. So where um, startups, where engineers, uh, where venture capital can come together and iterate on new ideas and, and launch new concepts. Um, we're really excited about a specific pro program on the H2 Nexus where we've partnered with four HBCUs in developing a diverse um, new energy specialization. So uh, students would come in and would learn from subject matter experts uh, as well as trained faculty on how to do project finance, how to do regulatory affairs, um, all with a focus on, on renewable energy projects. Um, the H2 Manufacturing is a, uh, an applied research uh, and prototyping facility that would be adjacent to the H2 Nexus, sort of complementing this, this notion of an um, innovation district. And then finally, a, a really neat uh, project that we've identified is that we're partnering with the Port of South Louisiana in acquiring a bunkering barge, which uh, would be the first bunkering barge enabling vessels run on hydrogen fuels to dock and fuel, uh, in this case, uh, electric methanol or e-methanol, which is a hydrogen fuel uh, derivative. Um, this barge would be the second in the globe after the port of Rotterdam that has a similar one uh, and would essentially create a fueling infrastructure for new vessels um, of which Louisiana is so, is so strong in terms of marine transportation and I think sets us up for, for future public-private partnerships. So these are the, the, the six work streams that make up our, um, our pitch, uh, our concept around a competitive cluster. And because we've mentioned the infrastructure bill, uh, I'd also like to point out that this, we hope, is going to be a basis and a competitive advantage as we uh, look to ha apply for a, um, a hydrogen hub uh, concept that is also part of the infrastructure funding. So I think it sets us up um, pretty effectively in the pursuit of that. Um, so that's a, a brief overview, but I welcome any, any questions on that. And thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. Bowden. It's really a very exciting uh, project. Um, you know, we're, we're very excited to be a supporting partner in, in it because um, it really pulls to get together so many threads, mm -hmm. you know, not just on, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and uh, promoting renewables and, and uh, fuel switching, but also, you know, drawing on collaboration and bringing in universities and our HBCUs and, and um, really pulling together so many threads. So we're very excited. I guess I'll ask, what is the timeline looking forward? Uh, if you could hit on that, just so everybody understands sort of uh, what, what to expect and when. Yeah, good question. So the timeline is submission is next Tuesday. So I'll be sprinting back to New Orleans and, and finishing our um, filling out the paperwork and um, we've heard that the decision is going to come pretty quickly so end of April maybe early May we should hear back if we are one of 30 finalists or, or awardees of this so we're competing with 59 other applications so we're hoping that with a 50-50 shot we're, we'll make it to the final phase Excellent. and then Thank implementation you. would happen uh, October of this year very exciting Secretary Harris I just wanted to thank you for not only this presentation, but all the work that you and GNO Inc. are doing on trying to bring this all together for Louisiana. I also can't pass on an opportunity to discourage the use of color designations for hydrogen and encourage the use of numerical carbon intensity scale. Uh, just wanted to get that. No, out I appreciate there. that. Secretary thank Harris. you. Thank you, Secretary Harris. Uh, Mr. Daniels. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I second the Secretary's point about the, the carbon intensity point. Uh, this is really exciting. It looks, um, looks amazing. A couple of questions. One of the things that we were wrestling with in putting the cap together is trying to match our effort with impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. So as you all talk about um, 
this great chart that's showing the sort of green and blue and gray and thinking about the impact. I, um, I love to see the wind, uh, the wind energy in here. Are, is there any way to measure what the actual impact is? It's, it's, diff it's a little difficult to tell whether it's a great project that will create jobs but mm -hmm. won't have much impact. And if so, how can we start to track that impact as a way of knowing whether we're doing the right, whether we're focusing our efforts in you the know, right place? It's an important component. The, um, the challenge, or rather the, the way to calculate it, would be mm -hmm. what is it replacing? Mm -hmm. you know, what what um, hydrogen, existing hydrogen use are we replacing with this green hydrogen? Is it uh, a new end use that we haven't seen in the industrial corridor, or is it existing great? Gray hydrogen. gray hydrogen would be very easy to, to quantify sure. what the, the, the saving would be. Uh, new uses would be a little bit more, more difficult, clearly. Okay. Um, but no, uh, your point is well taken that, that uh, I think sometimes the, the colors get a little too confusing and, and we lose sight of the actual goal, which is to reduce carbon intensity. Um, f for this application, it was a way to, to demonstrate that um, the eagerness and the interest in offshore wind, mm -hmm. which from a jobs perspective... Yeah. It is so interesting uh, for for our state because it allows mm -hmm. offshore oil and gas workers uh, to see new opportunities and, and utilize the, really the unique expertise not just in the U.S. but around the globe in deploying projects off in yeah. in, in the uh, in the continental shelf. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, the other thing I noticed I really appreciate in the H two Nexus the partnership with the four HBCUs, mm -hmm. uh, which. The, in Louisiana, are they are. They are. Yeah, so Xavier, yeah. Um, Dillard, um, Southern, yeah. and Southern and and I'm in One thing that might make you more competitive is to be um, a bit more targeted in the workforce um, area about the goals to hire, particularly people of color and others, and that are proportional mm -hmm. to the state's population, in a way that allows us to get my my family grew up in oil and gas and so I, I know the the disparities that exist in yep. where the regular jobs are versus the good jobs and I think for um, to get real support and make this really competitive yep. if you guys can speak to how people who normally don't get these jobs anyway mm -hmm. are really going to be targeted specifically yep. that would be great to, um, it, to show us what you're it's, what you're it's a big piece do. and it would take probably another 10 minutes just to describe all of the equity uh, pieces that we have within each project sure. but I can tell you that a um, couple of our coalition members include the Louisiana Ch Chamber for um, Commerce Chambers, yeah. which uh, they've got a great network of over 900 uh, DBE businesses around the state. Yeah. And, and a part of the H2 business development component mm -hmm. is to ensure that DBE businesses are aware and trained in accessing the procurement yeah. uh, opportunities around these sectors. Sure. Yeah, word, word to the wise. I mean, and you know this already, but I'll just... Um, just for the sake of expressing it, what we know is unless you put a number on it, mm. um, you're not going to reach that goal, right? right. So I, I chair the Regional Transit Authority in New Orleans. We have a 35% DBE goal. We right. have to meet it or somebody's going to be in trouble. Right, like right. It, it's a standard. Um, we have a labor representation standard that says based on the population of the city or the region, mm -hmm. that's what our workforce is going to look like. So. I just want to push us to, to go a little bit further. And as you prepare to submit the proposal, I think it would make you a lot more competitive. I, I think it's a critical piece, yeah. especially as we go into the implementation phase. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. Uh, Dr. Calavota. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, two questions. How much, you know, it says 25 to 100 million. How much are we actually asking for? And who is going to be who's going to be the actual recipient the administrator of the funds yeah so we'll be asking the latest number uh, is 74 million of federal funds um because we didn't go for the full 100 um and the uh, the funds actually each work stream that you see here is is a different uh, co-applicant so for workforce for example it would be the lctcs system it would be the direct applicant um, for the H2 business development, it's going to be the Baton Rouge Area Chamber. Um, Gino Inc., uh, our foundation, has one or two projects in there. And under the test beds, it's each individual university would be uh, the recipient of the funds. Okay. So it's, it's the entire coalition. So when you take all those individual parts, it adds up to $74 million. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Calavota.
Any other questions from our, our task force members? Mr. Haas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, yeah, I, if you could go back, I know you touched on this, but but uh, I'm curious again about process and where we're going from here. So there were mm -hmm. 500 and something you said, phase one or phase zero applications. Yep. That was whittled down to 60? Correct. Okay, and so the next round of approvals will will be uh, full approval of the of the program. There's not a second step that you move to implementation then. C correct. So yeah. So we submit in in next couple of days. Yeah. And then wait for for final approval to see if we if we made the the winning list of of getting the full amount. Okay. Of the th you know, and so EDA has instructed us that to think about twenty to thirty final applicants will will get funding. Okay, well, I would suggest, I, I don't know if this is important in the application process or not, but that perhaps the, the task force could offer a, a letter of support um, um, if we have that discussion, Mr. Chairman, and and um, um, deem it appropriate that uh, that might be something that we could consider. Agreed, and I think we're working with, with the chairman on, on a letter of support, so we appreciate your support as well. Well, excellent. Um, and do we want to, and so I know, LED and DNR have been involved uh, as well, and so, uh, but I don't think it could hurt if the the task force were interested in uh, moving toward, a, you know, in favor of sending uh, a letter of support. That is something that you know we can entertain as a as a motion. <clears throat> okay. Well, we have uh, a motion on the table from Dr. Calavoda. Do I have second. a second? A second from Mr. Lambert. Uh, any uh, discussion from the task force members on submitting a, a letter of support in, in, in support of this proposal? Mm -hmm. Stan, I'm happy to send you the full proposal if you'd like to take a look. Uh, were you, Dr. Chambers, were you looking to? Yes, I just wanted to make a comment about the proposal and the motion to provide a letter of support. <clears throat> uh, I'm a UL Lafayette professor, and I have been working on our university's component proposal, and so I'm quite familiar with the whole thing and also familiar with the goals of this task force. So. Although you may not just want to take my word for it, what I <laughs> uh, I will tell you that it is my very strong opinion that the goals of this proposal are perfectly aligned with the goals of the task force and with the Louisiana Climate Action Plan, and that it would be one very good step. The very, I mean, the very first concrete step like next week we can take a step to actually implement this and I think it's terrific and I highly uh, encourage that we this uh, task force to support the motion to provide a letter of support thank you dr. chambers uh, miss Manning broom I have a question yes. not but not about the letter okay uh, well then we will hold it until yeah. Uh, after the vote, uh, Mr. Lambert. Um, oh, you're, you're you're blinking. Um, all right. Any public comment? Hearing none. All in favor of, of submitting a letter of support in favor of the H two, the future proposal. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? We have one abstention. Oh. I would abstain it well. I just haven't had a chance to review the proposal. Okay, so we have two abstentions, but the the motion passes, and so uh, look forward to supporting this as a task force. Uh, and now we'll get to your question, uh, Ms. Manning Broom. Right, um, and so I I know that you've been working with the state agencies. Um, the last couple of days, we've been talking about just the importance of. Um, supporting and building state capacity and a large part of implementing the climate action plan is um, really going to be around um, you know supporting our energy office and so 
uh, how 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 does how does moving this forward really support and build out uh, state capacity in, in our energy office? I mean, I would say in multiple fronts. So what we're looking to do is is um, a couple of things is to bring in industry. A lot of emphasis on this application is around industry engagement mm -hmm. and, and looking to industry to think about uh, project implementation and how do we actually get to five gigawatts of offshore wind. And so bringing industry, bringing the voice of the industry, I think will provide the necessary voice in advancing, um, as what my understanding is, the Department of Energy, mm -hmm. uh, as well as this, this climate action force. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're also looking at uh, raising capacity in, in uh, developing technologies, mm -hmm. developing technologies that can be commercialized through the universities, um, developing the workforce, uh, and developing a, a messaging that is consistent with what the industry is looking for. Mm -hmm. Do resources directly go to the state agencies in this proposal? State agencies, um, well, the universities, if you consider the university state agencies, um, and some of the port players, Port of South Louisiana, as well as the Port of New Orleans, being state um, entities, okay. would also receive funding. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Manning Broom. Any other questions from our task force members? All right. Well, thank you again, Mr. Bowden. We uh, hope thank you, uh, that you're very successful in, in uh, receiving the, the grant award, and uh, we look forward to inviting you back in the future to, to learn more, uh, particularly if it is successful. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> thank you for thank, the opportunity. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, next up, uh, Ms. Tushar Matthews with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management uh, here to provide an update on the Gulf of Mexico Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force. Welcome, Ms. Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the committee. As the Chairman mentioned, I'm Tashara Matthews. I'm the Chief of Emerging Programs in our Gulf of Mexico Regional Office, which is located in New Orleans. So many of you already know, but the BOEM's mission responsibility um, consists of oil and gas on the outer continental shelf, also our marine minerals program, which is very big in the state of Louisiana, and the renewable energy. I'm currently over the marine minerals program and also the renewable energy program in our Gulf of Mexico office. So in last year, um, President Biden issued Executive Order 14008 which uh, established us to have 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, which would create nearly 80,000 jobs. So how are we gonna get there? So in November of 2021, um, the Bureau issued a leasing path forward, looking at the seven lease sales that we'll have throughout the country. If you notice here, the Gulf of Mexico was slated for a sale. It says late 2022, but we were looking at early of 2023 for a, a lease auction for renewable energy. So with a 30 gigawatt mandate, how are we going to get there? So currently we have an estimated capacity from our construction operations plans that's filed with the Bureau. Mainly those are all on the Atlantic. That gives us 19 gigawatts. Um, estimated capacity for the remaining lease sale is eight gigawatts. So in order to get to that 30 gigawatts by 2030, we have to have an additional lease areas. So today I'm going to talk more, of course, about the Gulf of Mexico. I'm going to give you a little bit more about background of how do we get here, our process, and then our next steps. So Louisiana Governor Edwards requested a task force on October 26, uh, 2020. Um, Bone responded back to say that we wanted to have a Gulf of Mexico region-wide task force. Our first meeting was held on June 15th of 2021. We had over 400 participants at the meeting. The purpose of the task force is to conduct outreach and collect data and information exchange. Um, the study that you see on the right is the NREL study. Our National Renewable Energy Lab conducted a study for us. It was published in 2020, showing the average speeds um, off in the Gulf of Mexico. If you notice, the highest speeds are off of Texas and also off of Louisiana. Um, in the study, it also showed the advantages of having offshore wind off of Louisiana and Texas um, because of the proximity oil and gas supply chain and leveraging those existing capabilities. However, we know that there are challenges here um, due to the, the hurricanes that we've had here, but we know that technology and the companies are working on those actual challenges. So the renewable energy process 
consists of four phases, planning and analysis, leasing, site assessment, and construction operations. So we are currently in the very early stages. We are in that planning and analysis phase where we form the task force. The only way we can actually start this renewable process is for a governor to initiate the task force. So by Governor Edwards um, initiating that task force, it started the process in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so we had that first meeting. We actually had our second one on February the 2nd of this year. We had a request for information, a call. They went out to see where are the industries interested in. We're currently working on that area identification to find out where's the best areas, what energy areas should we have, and we're conducting that environmental reviews. So the next steps, of course, will be the publishing those leasing notices. We hope to have those out by midsummer, have that auction, and then issue those leases. So this kind of goes into a little bit more of that planning and analysis phase. As I mentioned, we had that request for interest that was like in June of last year. We also had the call for, inf uh, for information, and that had a 45-day comment period, which ended in December. And so we're, uh, we're at the next step at that area identification phase and also the environmental phase. So how do we decide these areas? So we start very high-level, large area, Gulf of Mexico, and then we start winnowing down those areas. We had that call RFI area. I think it went out to 1,300 meters of water depth. It was off of uh, Alabama, Florida, all the way to the Texas-Mexico border. And then now we're in the call area phase where it was um, south of the, uh, west of the Mississippi River, all the way to Texas-Mexico border, out to 400 meters of water depth. And I'm going to show you those maps in just a second. And then we're going to continue to winnow down to define what we're calling the wind energy areas and further divide that into smaller lease areas. So this was that RFI area, as I mentioned initially, just to, we just wanted to see, hey, where are you interested in, in, in developing wind in the Gulf of Mexico? And then we received 39 comments. Ten of those were from industry. Um, now we're at the call phase. As you see, it's west of the Mississippi River. Um, it's the red outline at border of the map out to 400 meters of water depth. We received 40 comments, eight of those consisted of from industry. And this just kind of shows you that um, map of the combined areas and showing that winnowing down process that we're currently in. The green is that RFI area and the red is the actual call area itself. So some of the comments that we have received is the concern for the number of acreage that we're offering in the call area because on the Atlantic they offer smaller areas. Um, this current, the call area is currently like 30 million acres. But so once you put the actual oil and gas infrastructure into the picture, um, you see there's not a lot of area left for wind farm. Um, most of the wind farm areas will consist of at least 80,000 acres for a one gigawatt farm. Um, so that's the type of acreage that we're looking for in order to have. If we're looking for smaller amounts of, of gigawatts, then we can go down in acreage. And also technology changes. You can have less acreage if you have a, a higher producing turbine. So this is the area of uh, companies of interest that we published in, our, I think, our task force meeting showing where companies are interested. This is, of course, the public copy. Um, if this is a black border outline of the call area, those areas that are outside of that black line um, we received in the initial RFI, the request for interest, um, those companies can still come into BOEM and request what we call an unsolicited lease request to us. So you just notice where the, um, the interest is currently. And I do want to, I guess I want to pause here because in the Atlantic, um, once they get down, they normally do their environmental assessment and their NEPA off of the actual wind energy areas, the smaller areas that I just mentioned. We're doing a little different approach uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. We're actually going to do our environmental assessment on the actual call area so that if we have a company that may come in, um, as I mentioned, unsolicited lease request, the um, environmental assessment will already be done. The consultations with uh, NOAA will have been completed. And also, if a state comes in and wants to do a research lease, that in that call area, that environmental analysis will also be done. So we're doing a little bit, we're doing more of a programmatic approach. So these are the types of turbine structures that have been mentioned in the applications that the companies nominated, uh, jackets and floating substructures in waters greater of 60 meters. Um, in the NREL study that I mentioned earlier, monopiles wasn't recommended for the Gulf of Mexico due to the soft soils. However, technology may change. There may be ways that we can incorporate monopiles as well. 
And this just shows you a typical um, wind farm layout that pictures actually of Block Island. Um, the turbines at the top is the jacket formation or foundation. And then the ones at the bottom is actually the floating turbines showing the cables going back to shore. And this kind of just gives you a quick snapshot of some of the stakeholder engagement milestones that we had. I know um, Chairman Harry I mentioned 50 meetings. We, we've had about 100 so since last year to try to make sure we reached out to our stakeholders and engaging with them early and often to better understand their concerns. <laughs> and so here we are. Um, we currently had our I want to note the fishery summits that we had in January on the 19th and 20th. There were four sector based fishery summits. Um, so we had over 200 participants for total. Um, actually, it was very informative. It went very well. Um, we, had, we held that second task force meeting on February the 2nd, and we're currently uh, redoing the, conducting the environmental assessment. And we're working closely with NOAA to work, um, identify those wind energy areas. So back in November of 2021, NOAA published something called the Aquaculture Opportunity Areas for the Gulf of Mexico. And the fishermen love the way that they house the data in the model. It's, it's called marine spatial planning. And so we're using that model for to identify our wind energy areas. This is the first time that has been done in the country. Um, on the Atlantic, they don't use this process. So we're, I guess we're, we're leading the, for, the charge with that. Um, so we are utilizing the data that NOAA has for the shrimp data, all of the fisheries data that they have, and also their protected uh, species and resources will go in the, into that model as well. So once we, we're hoping to have those areas identified internally by the end of this month, and then we'll start uh, going back out to stakeholders to announce those areas once that's done. And so we're hoping to publish that proposed sale notice in the Federal Register by mid-July. We're targeting that. And so this is my team, and this is my contact information. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Matthews. Appreciate you coming and presenting. And uh, BOEM has been a tremendous partner uh, in moving forward on offshore winds. So, so thank you for that. Um, I do have a quick question on, on timeline. Um, what is BOEM's best estimate of, of having the, the first auction for offshore wind in the Gulf? Is that? Uh, what is the timeline that y'all are looking at? Yeah, we're looking at the first quarter of 2023, um, just because we want to make sure that we get the wind energy areas right. So it kind of pushed us back a little bit. We want to make sure we're engaging the stakeholders. Um, we know that we have a lot of lessons learned from the from the Atlantic areas, and so we want to make take that extra time to working with those stakeholders before we define an area and offer those leases, so that we're trying to deconflict as much as possible prior to offering a lease. Excellent. Very exciting. Yep. Uh, Mr. Haas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for that presentation, Ms. Matthews. I, I, one thing that I don't, I didn't hear you mention, and I'm, I'm curious about, is how you evaluate um, routes for trans, transmission. How, how is the energy transferred to shore? Are you evaluating those routes? And, and I'll get maybe to my specific point after you answer that question. Yeah, so on the Atlantic, um, they're actually doing some changes because the projects that they've already leased, um, that comes in the, at a later stage, at the construction operation phase, which is about 10 years from now. So they are doing those, for, initially they were doing those for individual projects, but now they're using more of a regional transmission approach. And so that's the approach we're going to go with in the Gulf of Mexico, using what we're, they're calling a backbone, mm -hmm. so that the companies don't, can all tie in and bring it back. And we're okay. trying to, we want to utilize existing um, right-of-ways so that we're not um, damaging or adding more um, impacts. Um, and we're hearing from some developers maybe possibly using um, pipelines to actually put the cables in hmm. and, and bring them back to shore. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. What the the um, thought that I've had, I guess, and the concern uh, would would be um, if there were uh, kind of this sort of large network spaghetti, uh, you know, diagram, if you will, of transmission lines, how that might impact our ability to access uh, another mineral sand, which right. can be really important to uh, to the coastal restoration program. So we just want to make sure we're avoiding those resources where we can. Right. The great thing is that I'm over the marine minerals program yeah. as well, right. and so <laughs> in our and so that model that I talked about, there's two there are two layers: the constraints layer and also the suitability model. And the constraints layer is that significant set 
sediment resource areas. Yeah. So we work very closely with uh, CPRA, and we just received an update from them. So we make sure that we stay out of those areas and not put additional stress in those areas because we know that you all need that. Not only Sam, but you all are um, requesting the sediment now yeah. um, too. So okay. we're looking at that. Well, I'm preaching to the choir then. Good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Haas. Uh, Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Matthews, it's great, right, to, see it's great to see you again. It's good, it's good to see you in, in person. And I just want to state uh, for the record, since the, the time the governor's letter went in, you and your team, the whole BOEM team, uh, you've been extremely uh, collaborative and, and sharing information, working with us as we, we try to work through this process. So I just wanted to say a, a public thank you to you and the, the BOEM team, specifically that New Orleans uh, regional office as you continue to work through this and, and also holding to that to that timeline that we could potentially have this auction uh, maybe sooner than a year from now. You know, right. we're, we're, we're March 2022. Uh, would love to be able to have something in January or February of 2023. So uh, thank you again uh, for your work. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I would just second that uh it's been a pleasure working with with you and your team uh we'll go now to mr moses uh, thank you thank you mr chairman uh, thank you for the presentation Ms. matthew that was very good very informative um i was trying to take a few notes but i may have missed a few things okay. it's very interesting to me um so did you say for one megawatt one gigawatt one gigawatt yep. it's eighty thousand acres yes sir okay that, that's that's what i wanted to make sure i had one one gigawatt and that's what the current technology um that's what like a we're estimating on off of a 10 megawatt turbine so as right now i think ge is proposing that they have a, a 15 megawatt turbine on the market they're getting ready to go to market so we wouldn't have to use as much acreage because you have a turbine that can generate more power so some of the acreage can go down very good thank you ma'am you're welcome very good question Dr. Burkett. Yes. Hi, Virginia Burkett. And I was Secretary of Wildlife and Fisheries years ago when okay. we worked with Villery Reggio from your office years yes. ago. And we did marine special planning for what we call the Reeks to Reefs program. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very helpful for the shrimpers to come in and help us identify areas in the Gulf that were their preferences for where we would put these abandoned, not abandoned rigs, but to recycle the rigs for fishing. And um, Something came up then that looking at 80,000 acres per gigawatt, and you're looking at 80 gigawatts, <laughs> the impact on fisheries. Mm -hmm. Are you considering plans to compensate fishermen that are going to be impacted by this sort of a huge scale development of offshore wind? Right. So we had a fisheries mitigation um, meeting back in December. Currently, our regs do not, um, the renewable energy regs do not uh, allow us to do compensation mitigation. Um, we are working on some mitigation guidelines. And so we did have a fisheries uh, meeting throughout the nation to better understand what those impacts could be and possibly what, how could we set up something for, for that. Um, we've also been working very closely. I've been going to the task force meetings um, at LDWF and also working with the Southern Shrimp Alliance to better understand their concerns as well. Uh, those higher uh, targeted fishing grounds, either to remove them completely or to mitigate those areas where we can have enough spacing uh, in between the turbines that they're able to still trawl and to turn around. So looking at that as a mitigation as well. And the other consideration that really came out then was that MMS did not actually better than the state did. That's why we have these abandoned structures along our wetlands. Um, but the removing everything from the premises, you know, ever so there's no trash or debris, marine debris on the bottom outside of the planting areas that would have interfered with with the trawlers. So remember to consider that also. Right. Yes, we do have a decommissioning plan as, okay. that comes in as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burkett. All right, well, thank you so much for coming in, Ms. Matthews. All right, thank you. All right, uh, next on the agenda, uh, modeling uncertainty analysis. Allison DeYoung is, was unable to come in today, and so uh, it will be uh, Lindsay Cooper who will be providing that update. And Charles is right and after me. 
Hi, everyone. It's great to be back with you today. I am providing an update on behalf of Allison DeYoung and the Water Institute. The, the modeling, especially the energy policy simulator tool, became such a big part of our planning process. And we saw a lot of uncertainties that were represented as we were working with the emission pathway model that were raised from you all and from members of the science advisory group. So the Water Institute's doing a research study on the EPS model that will use methods, as they've called, under decision making, under deep uncertainty, to test different variables within the EPS model to see how it performs under a variety of ranges. And that's a very technical way, a technical way to say that they're diving into how can we better understand the uncertainties that exist with the EPS model and how can that help us identify low regret actions to implement regardless of future uh, factors. So they've identified some key outputs that they want to test alongside some variables that have the most certainty or are most critical to understand if strategies and actions perform well. So we want to utilize the EPS to develop a tool that will help us measure success of our strategies and actions over time. And to utilize the EPS in that way, it needs to make some significant improvements. So that's the, the work that they've started on. And as they get further into research, Allison said that she'll be happy to brief the task force on their findings, but to know that they are continuing to work on refining the modeling techniques. All right, thank you, Ms. Cooper. Is that the, the update? That's the update. And uh, perhaps we will need to invite uh, Allison back for another time when she can elaborate a little bit further. But any questions, uh, with that said, from the task force members? All right, seeing none. Uh, Mr. Sutcliffe, I believe you'll be providing an update on Climate Action Plan Outreach. Yes, just uh, another short one as well, but something that I think is, is important, um, that we are, we are starting to kind of take take this uh show on the road a little bit um get out of baton rouge so much of this plan was developed as you all know under extreme covid conditions and now that that is loosening up and now that we have some certainty around what louisiana's plan you know is um we're excited to start going out and trying to reach some new audiences and some diverse audiences around the state um, we think this is important just for a um, general education, just that we're doing this, this is what's in there, this is what's happening, but also as a way to kind of build support for implementation uh, um, across different sectors. Um, so this is what we're, we're trying to do. Our idea is to um, kind of do a couple things, especially in, in, in areas where we, we, where we, you know, like ourselves don't go as, as often. You know, we are, again, coming out of this coastal program, and so um, we want to get out to, to Shreveport and Alexandria and out, outside of the coast. Um, but um, we're, we're thinking of looking at um, doing both a, a grass tops meeting, kind of so hitting some of those economic development groups, some community organizations, um, those types, some university folks uh, on, on one side. Um, but also, so, so there we can kind of, A, make sure that, that the leadership in these different regions are, are kind of aware of this, um, and so that people aren't coming in to the public meeting, which I also want to talk about, um, completely cold, having never seen some of this information before. So we want to kind of precede uh, the grass tops and then, and then show up later for a, for a, a more public meeting format. Uh, where we can um, mostly provide information again so we have we have so much in this climate plan that that's on your desk um, from just the, you know what are the emissions what's the emissions inventory from the state what are what are the different impacts that we that we're seeing and, and expecting in the future and how was the plan developed you know I think that's so much of that is, is, is important to, for people to understand so they can kind of better appreciate what this plan is and what it isn't um, and then obviously what are what are the strategies and actions that are actually being proposed in there so we want to um, do that we're in early stages of planning I had a great conversation with Arthur Johnson this morning at the lower ninth Ward Center for sustainable engagement and development so kind of thinking about New Orleans being our pilot project uh, coming up soon hopefully the end of this month you know might as well get started um and then we've also got um a phone call tomorrow with the kathleen blanco Pol uh, public policy center at the university of lafayette so dr chambers will be looping you in too soon don't worry um and so uh those are the first two stops along the way and uh we again we're hoping to kind of grow that but we want to do it strategically we want to we want to um like i said reach new and diverse audiences as we do this so um we're going to start in New Orleans and Lafayette and then kind of go from there. And I'm um, happy to take any questions or suggestions that you have for ways to kind of, you know, expand our reach and, and, and make this effective. Thanks.
Thank you, Mr. Sutcliffe. Any questions from our task force members? All right. More to come. Thank you both. Uh, next, Blake Canfield from DNR uh, will provide an update on the oil field site restoration program. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, task force members. Glad to be here. Uh, so uh, wanted to come and just tell you kind of what's the latest. We have an oil field site restoration program within the Department of Natural Resources, which spends roughly $8 million annually uh, to plug and restore orphan oil field sites in the state. Uh, currently, the number of orphan oil field sites is listed as about 4,600 across the state. Uh, that is significantly higher than it was uh, just two or three years ago. At that point, it was 2,000 uh, oil field sites. Uh, based upon information we have regarding, you know, existing production at oil field sites throughout the state, we expect this number to continue to grow and potentially grow in a very large way. Uh, so it's one of the main problems that the state needs to get its hands on and figure out how to address. Uh, and as was mentioned a few times today, uh, there is actually some significant funding opportunities in the IAJA uh, from the federal uh, government that has the potential to completely transform the oil field site restoration program. Uh, so as I mentioned, we currently are spending about $8 million. We're looking under the IIJA as qualifying for somewhere around 150 to 160 million or more over the next five to 10 years. Uh, the other thing that's gonna be, uh, be apparent as, or is becoming apparent as we're going through the guidance and guidelines that have been provided so far, uh, as was mentioned, I think by Mr. Wright, we're still waiting on a lot of the guidance and guidelines on specifics, but some of the things that are gonna be a focus uh, under the federal program and the federal dollars that's currently not part of the OSR program is monitoring methane emissions from orphan sites, uh, being able to estimate uh, how much of the methane will be, uh, emissions will be reduced through plugging, how to track that. Uh, also, job opportunities as a key aspect of this. Uh, you had a lot of job losses associated in the oil and gas industry, uh, especially over the last two to three years with COVID and then prior to that with various uh, bust cycles of the oil industry. Uh, and, and then third, another element that's added to this is consideration of uh, the oil, the abandoned oil field sites on disadvantaged communities, communities of color, tribal communities, communities that have lower income, um, and finding ways to include that within our prioritization of uh, the wells that are being addressed in the program. Uh, so the plan is to try to, uh, again, we'll have to wait on the final guidance, but try to use the ability, uh, the additional funding that's gonna be provided at the federal level to not only address wells with that money, but then also to stand up the program to increase its capacity uh, and hopefully have a program that will be able to handle a lot of these issues on a go forward basis, uh, even after that money is gone. Um, very quickly, the uh, IIJA breaks the funding down into three types of grants. The first initial grant is for $25 million. We're expecting that to be released some point relatively soon. It could be as early as the uh, end of this fiscal year, so about June uh, time period. Uh, or it may be a little bit later. Again, we're waiting to, to find that out. Second, they have a formula grant. That's the largest portion of money uh, that's available under the IIJA. Uh, at the federal level, it's a spend of $2 billion across the, uh, all the states that are trying to qualify. I believe there's 26 states that are asking for this money. And that the amount that our state will receive is a bit unknown. Uh, as also was mentioned, you know, they're waiting on funding at the federal level. Uh, what they estimate our state to receive is about 111 million, but we're doing everything we can to make, uh, to come up with a plan or a program that's more enticing and hopefully get more dollars out of that formula grant. And then finally, there are performance grants dealing with regulatory changes and increased funding matching grant portion of that. Uh, and together, those the matching portion and the regulatory improvement, that's an additional $50 million uh, that the state is, is could see. So for all those reasons, we are very excited about the possibilities. Um, we are currently working through different procurement options on how to do this. Our uh, initial thought is to try to come up with a handful of very large projects, large procurement projects, um, so as to entice the workers to stay on the job here in Louisiana because we'll be competing with similar uh, spins of federal money out of Texas and out of Oklahoma. And we wanna make sure that we're not in a situation where our workers are being enticed to leave and go to Texas or to Oklahoma or elsewhere uh, to get to get uh, work there. 
Um, and then finally, we're looking for other funding opportunities and other ways to increase the amount of state, uh, I guess, the efficiency of the spend that we have with state dollars. <clears throat> Some additional opportunities that we're investigating. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has reached out to us to plug uh, orphan wells on federally owned property in the state. Uh, and so this may be either through a reimbursement to our program or direct payment from U.S. Fish and Wildlife with using, I guess, our uh, uh, OSR program uh, to, to oversee it. And then finally, we're also looking at uh, the possibility of creating some type of uh, jobs uh, aid program under the American Rescue Plan. Uh, that is going to take a little bit more research. You know, it's not a, a, a definite, you know, uh, a thing, but hopefully it too could provide us some, with some additional funding. Um, so like I said, we are at the beginning stage on this, but we, we have a lot of high hopes that this will actually be able to transform our program in a positive way, not just for the spin of this federal uh, money, but also uh, going forward. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Canfield. Uh, I see Mr. Haas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks, Mr. Canfield. I did have uh, just a couple of questions for you. One, you'd mentioned Texas and Oklahoma. So, how, where where does where does Louisiana stand in terms of how we rank? And you, do we do you say forty six hundred uh, orphan wells? Yeah, forty six hundred wells. So, so how, how does that stack up? Right, nationwide. So nationwide, uh, we are. I want to say sixth, maybe most in of 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 the states. Uh, it may be eighth. I'll have I hate to tell you wrong, but it's somewhere in that six to eight range. Yeah, uh, we have fewer than Texas or Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma actually added a, a significant number of wells, like tripled the number of orphan wells uh, overnight. Uh, and we think that may be a definitional issue dealing with their law and our law. But yet again, something that we are looking into from a uh, funding perspective to see if we can't get higher on that list. Um, you likewise saw total number of wells that many of the states that were involved in the very first uh, uh, you know, I guess round of oil and gas development in the 19th century have many tens of thousands of wells. So thinking of Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Ohio, uh, so they, they actually are at the, the top as far as the numbers go there. Now, uh, for cost, though, of course, our potential cost per well will likely be greater than many of these states because of the uh, both the coastal and the offshore uh, environment. Yeah. Uh, as well as the depth of those wells, uh, which are your two biggest, you know, aspects for determining cost on the plug. Okay. And I, this is probably a question you can't answer. Um, so I'll grant you some, some grace there right off the bat. But in terms of, because we don't know how much money we're going to get yet, mm -hmm. right? But do you have a sense of sort of how, how much of, uh, of this problem we can chip away at with, with what might be coming to the state? Yeah, I mean, so the correct answer is no. We're, we're, we're waiting to see, yeah. but I'll, I'll give you a, a, a sense of it. Uh, based on our current program, how much our current program spends uh, per site, we estimate of those 4,600 wells or so that the cost would be uh, about $450,000, I believe. Uh, I mean, 400, not thousand, four hundred fifty million million uh, to, 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 to address all of those. Uh, but as I said, we expect the number of orphan wells to increase, not decrease. Uh, further, if we are including additional, uh, you know, angles on this, including the methane tracking, uh, including, and I, I didn't even mention this, I meant to mention this as well, uh, water quality and uh, contamination prevention. So, you know, perhaps doing more sampling on the front end. Uh, currently, we sample only afterwards, but we then don't have a before and after. Uh, those costs may rise. Yeah. So um, that's kind of the other caveat. Okay. Well, that, that helps kind of put some sideboards on it then. Thank you very much. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, just yeah. uh, take another moment. I do think that the, the things you mentioned about how to prioritize which which wells uh, to, to address first and then also, of course, actually measuring uh, the impact uh, that plugging these things will have is, is just key and right in line with the recommendations that this task force uh, approved. So good on you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haas. Secretary Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Blake, for the presentation. What I have is really not so much a question for Blake, but a comment. You know, some of the information is st has yet to be released on what the requirements are going to be for a lot of this federal money. Some of the information Br Blake just told you we found out on a call less than four hours ago, including the requirements for methane monitoring and, and groundwater monitoring. We were already planning on doing before and after 
uh, sampling for methane to determine the amount of methane reduction we were accomplishing with plugging with this federal money. Late last week, I told the governor, to my knowledge, we were the only state that was planning to do so, and we found out today that every state will be doing that. <laughs> uh, that drastically impacts the amount uh, that it's going to cost per well, mm -hmm. like Blake mentioned. So would, there are other details I'm pretty sure we're not yet aware of and will be released formally. So this is a, a definitely a work in, in progress. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Secretary. But work in progress, but a fantastic opportunity to really chip away at um, methane emissions and those high, uh, high impact emissions. Uh, Mr. Moses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, Mr. Haas already asked the unfair question, so I won't go there. Uh, and, but I do want to tell you thank you for your efforts and, and you and your staff. I know it's a, a long road ahead of you, and we'll be glad to work with you in any way we can. Yeah, and I want to thank you because you've already been a major help, and uh, we definitely appreciate your uh, help on the procurement side especially. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Moses. All right. Uh, not seeing any questions. You're still up at the table uh, to talk about uh, model, model solar ordinance uh, and kind of hit that in uh, tandem with Camille Manning Broom. I was going to say, I'm going to give a very quick statement and then I'm going to hand it off to, uh, to Ms. Manning Broom, who's going to do a much better job uh, eloquently explaining everything. But um, so one of the, uh, one of the recent, I guess, uh, directives that we were given at the legislature, this was last session, was to look into regulation of solar energy. And we had, pursuant to that, a couple of public hearings uh, where we were able to listen to the concerns of various members of the public, of uh, solar development uh, companies, uh, of other interest groups. And it became very uh, clear early on that we weren't dealing with just like one main issue we were dealing with a a large number of varied concerns that were being brought up um, and, and it was also the little bit of research we were able to do at that time clear that most of the time other states had allowed for uh, local government to make decisions especially regarding uh, you know, locating uh, zoning requirements and the like uh, in speaking with a few of the local governments, it was also clear that this was brand new to them and that they were put in a bad spot to have to try to on the fly come up with uh, zoning requirements for something that's new to them. Uh, and, and so we were actually very grateful uh, for CPEX uh, to, uh, to, to approach us with a uh, opportunity to partner with them uh, regarding coming up with a model ordinance uh, for solar uh, development. And it is, a, a, I know, a huge task. We've already had a couple of meetings. We, uh, at least I can speak from DNR's perspective, we're getting a lot of very good information from those meetings. Uh, but uh, with that, I'm going to kick it to uh, Ms. Manning Broom to give a little bit more detail. Thank you so much, Blake. It is a uh, wonderful opportunity to provide our locals with um, tools uh, uh, that can help them in making good decisions around land use. Uh, and the future of their communities. And so it's been a great partnership. Uh, essentially what we've done is set the table. Uh, we've, we've developed a large advisory committee uh, where we have all the interest um, from the energy sector, the farmers, the landowners, uh, local planning and zoning, um, uh, environmental advocates, you know, just across the board, uh, anyone that might have an issue or might have a different way of viewing this uh, is has a seat at the table and we're we're listening and we're co-designing uh, these model ordinances so that one we can protect our community's character we can give them the tools that they need um, to make sure that uh, we're all good neighbors and two that solar industry has a, a seat at the table to help in crafting what those tools look like so that they uh, don't prohibit uh, good solar development um, the ordinance will will be a model and therefore um, you know need to be tailored and used to meet the specific community needs um, but we're not just looking at utility scale solar 
Uh, we're going to develop model ordinances for community scale solar and household solar. So we are we're going to hit it at every scale, uh, give all the tools necessary to local communities who, um, at the end of the day, uh, need are the ones who make decisions on regulating their land use. Um, so it's been a great opportunity. Um, we sent out a request for applicants through the Louisiana Municipal Association and the Police Jury Association. Uh, we are selecting a couple of communities to work hand in hand with, where we will, um, not only while we're developing the model code, we'll implement it um, with them, with their planning commissions through the process. And then we're gonna go uh, on a road show, uh, traverse the state, holding large public meetings, uh, rolling out the opportunities um, with our partners within the realtor associations, the home builders, um, many others, uh, just like we've done before with our with all of our code work. Uh, just on an aside, if you haven't noticed, um, we, CPEX is a planning organization. We develop plans and we write uh, codes and ordinances to help communities uh, guide their future land use. So. Very grateful to be working on that. Um, also, um, Lindsay uh, asked me to talk a little bit about uh, Gonzales. Gonzales will be one of the communities that will be drafting the uh, solar ordinances for. Um, but in addition to that, pursuant to um, tw action item 12. Point let's see, is it 12.1, um, CPEX is also um, partnering with the Division of Administration um, to develop a framework for an Office of State Planning. Uh, that is the action item um, in, the, in, in the plan. Um, and part of that is helping local municipalities and parishes develop their own climate action plans. And so we are now um, also working with the city of Gonzales to develop a climate action plan uh, for the city of Gonzales. They will be the second uh, city in, in Louisiana to have their own climate action plan. Obviously the first uh, or the only one currently is in New Orleans. So um, all in all, it's great. And I'm grateful to be working with you, Blake and Jason and Dr. Um, uh, Secretary Harris on this so thank you yeah well, that's all very very exciting news uh, uh, thank you uh, Blake and Camille any questions from our task force members really excellent uh, to see that we're we're moving forward on so many fronts thank you thank you uh, next up Miss Cooper uh, to talk about equity metrics Sure, so I will close out the section of project updates. One of the, the big areas that we talked about advancing progress in is through developing metrics that will help us evaluate progress in implementing this climate action plan towards our fundamental objectives. And a particular area that we highlighted in the climate action plan was around equity. So we actually called that out specifically in the action plan in strategy 25. So we've submitted a proposal and actually received a grant already to identify metrics and develop indicators that will help in quantifying um, what our equity metrics look like in Louisiana. What does progress look like towards developing um, a and, and creating a more equitable society? So many other states have done this as well after their climate planning process. We see this as actually very timely coming from our workshop yesterday. We know that the federal government is prioritizing um, creating an equitable society as well. And we'll need to develop the, the right metrics and indicators of how we measure equity. Um, so this project, we're excited to focus on the climate action plan, but also see that it's transferable to the, the federal proposals that we'll be developing under the IIJA. So I wanted to bring this to your attention now since we're in the project scoping phase and I'll likely be reaching out to most of you in the coming month or two as we're, we're scoping what um, some of these different terms should mean as we're moving forward. We've um, discussed and come up with the definition of equity for the climate action plan, but want to think more broadly about some of the terminology we're using and we're having some helpful input from the federal government right now from different agencies on defining those terms and are excited to, to jump in on that important project. So I will keep you all updated on that. That's all I got. Thank you very much, Ms. Cooper. Any questions on that? Recognizing that there will be more to come. 
All right. Uh, with that, uh, we curated a list of project updates, but we, we didn't want to exclude any updates from the task force members. So at this point, I'll just open it up uh, to any of you who have any updates uh, that you'd like to share with the, the task force. Uh, Ms. Gotro. Is it on? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to update the members of the task force, and this has uh, implications for outreach. Many of you know that Nature Conservancy with uh, other partners has been working on supporting a source of conservation funding to leverage uh, federal and other dollars that we're missing out on. And as part of that effort, we put out a poll recently. Uh, we did one in 2018 to gauge the level of knowledge of the public and the support for conservation funding and put in a few climate questions. And we, this year, ran just in this February of this month, ran an update on that poll and we asked again some climate questions. So I just wanted to uh, report a couple of the findings as the task force is moving forward. Uh, first of all, this was uh, done between February 15th and 20th of this year, and the demographics reflected the demographics of the state um, in multiple arenas. And I won't go into a lot of details, but basically uh, it reflects rural, urban areas, ethnicities, uh, education levels, political parties, and so forth. And it turns out that 84 percent of voters support the state working with landowners to voluntarily conserve areas that naturally remove carbon from the air and 59% uh, strongly support that effort. Uh, it's, again, very strong across party lines. Um, from 77% um, supporting in GOP, ranging from a little higher, 90% for the Dems, and, but very strong, over 50% strongly support from these arenas. And then uh, it's strong across all regions of the state, which is a good thing to learn. And nearly three quarters of voters support the state taking action to reduce the carbon pollution that contributes to climate change with uh, 52 strongly supporting and 74% uh, supporting overall. And again, this is reflected across party lines and we're still teasing out the results since we just uh, received them, but I just wanted to pass that along. There is strong support in the public for addressing climate change and reducing carbon emissions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gotro, for that. Uh, update and if, if at any point uh, you can share you know the slides or um, figures with everybody yeah we'll be email. glad to do that um, as I said we just received them but we will we'll be pleased to do that Thank that, you. that would be fantastic just to, to see and better understand uh, where the citizens and residents of Louisiana are on, on climate change um, and various ways to to mitigate any other uh, updates or comments from our class task force members not seeing any, we will move right along uh, with implementation next steps. Uh, Ms. Lindsay Cooper. And as Ms. Cooper is getting set up, if you have any uh, a public comment, uh, you can and you're here in the audience, you can write it down on this and uh, I'll be sure to call out your name at the appropriate time at the end of the meeting. Okay, the floor is yours. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My presentation is not as exciting as some who came before me, but I did want to talk in a little bit more detail through the next steps in implementation of the administration, but also of the Climate Task Force and propose um, a recommended path forward for you all over the next two years, a uh, little less than two years of the administration. But first, I wanted to, to recognize the, the full action plan and the executive summary that you all have in front of you. Um, we're really excited about having these resources in print. We don't have the full action plan easily dispersable since it is such a big document, but we do encourage you to, to share, and I have extras of the executive summary as well, to share those with your networks. We see that these are great resources to have and to actually be able to hold them uh, as well. And we're in the process right now of translating the executive summary. I know that was a request at the January 31st task force meeting, so we're translating that into Spanish, French, and Vietnamese. So I will hopefully circulate those in the next week as they're available. Alongside all that the governor mentioned, some of the other administration 
next steps that that we all have been taking in the governor's office are around identifying actions for administrative leadership and sifting through pulling out from the 84 what um, does the administration have or potentially have authority over uh, beginning to have conversations across agencies is another key component that we've started our work on clarifying our near-term goals so goals that are quantified in the action plan but also what are our goals for the remainder of the administration further scoping agency authority to implement actions as the governor mentioned exploring opportunities for further action and strategizing stakeholder engagement so of course this is all very in the early stages we're only a month into implementation but we're excited to just dive right in over the next 22 months um, an additional component of our administrative approach is around the IIJA and the Climate Action Plan. Um, Jackson Wright spoke to this a little bit earlier, and we have I have worked with him on doing a crosswalk of the, the IIJA opportunities with the action plan by numbers. Um, and you can see the totals here are pretty incredible in potential funding for the climate action plan that comes through IIJA. And this is not divided across states. This is not competitive or formula. It's everything together. But there's nearly $30 billion for clean energy, $70 for industry, $5 billion for methane, $570 for transportation development in the built environment, over $22 billion for natural working lands and wetlands. Uh, over 420 for the economy, a low carbon economy, and $4 billion for tribal resilience. So as Jackson mentioned, we've been doing our homework to identify which state agencies are lead implementers. But in many of these proposals, there will need to be coordination across um, all of our various sectors. And ensuring that we have strong proposals means working with one another as we're moving forward in this effort. So we're excited for the Climate Task Force to be a venue through which we can continue that coordination, especially around such an exciting funding opportunity. And as Jackson also mentioned, there are four main components of federal focus. So it's around climate mitigation, equity workforce, and made in America. We do not have an objective around made in America, but we do have objectives around the other tenants of uh, the federal focus. So we have been working with the agencies and through the workshop yesterday on breaking down how we define objectives and our criteria to help agencies in thinking through how do we advance climate equity and workforce through our IIJ proposal. So there's a lot of, again, a lot of opportunity for overlap there that we're excited about. The other um, update, less from the administrative side, more from legislative, we're about to kick off the, not we, but the, the state of Louisiana in this building is about to kick off the 2022 regular session on Monday. And we wanted to make you all aware of the different bills that are out there related to climate. They are just organized by numbers. We're still doing analysis to understand uh, what all is contained in these bills, so we're not taking a position on them here, but wanted you to be aware that there are multiple bills circulating um, around the work that we're doing and want you all to be aware of and engaged in those um, as it begins to move forward just in a couple of days. Yes. I have a sure. Um, I One second. Was... All right. Can you hear me? It should be on, yes. Okay. <laughs> if Have you reviewed them in general um, and do you know the percentage that are perhaps in support of the climate action plan and um, just interested if the majority of them are against what we're doing I think we're we're still trying to wrap our heads around uh, right. what's in those what's in the bills and, and their impact and what they're trying to get at so uh, some of these just were, were you know filed in the last couple of days or we came aware of just uh, yesterday on some of them so uh, still kind of trying to work through them but I think it, it, it it's a mix okay it, it certainly is a mix so I want to turn attention from the administration we've heard some great updates from our outside stakeholders and from you all as well to start thinking about the the role of the task force as we move forward into implementation um, there's there are of course new rules that we all have to take on as 
in developing a plan than we do in implementing a plan. And we're excited for uh, you all to continue your work on on the the climate task force in this time. So I'm drawing our attention here to the action in the climate action plan that specifies the role of the climate initiatives task force. And so here we articulate that the the task force will provide high level vision for the high level vision for implementation and the need for regular meetings to ensure progress towards implementation, that we continue a transparent process, that we maintain a public focus of this work. And so using this as a, a basis, as we've written into the Climate Action Plan, I wanted to quickly walk through how we envision the role of the task force moving forward. Um, we're proposing that there be quarterly, regular quarterly meetings of the task force, and we can um, do a better job at scheduling these out since we'll, we'll know when they need to be calendared. Um, and, and proposing alongside of that three main roles for you all in implementation. So engaging, advising, and leading. On the front of engaging, um, that you all would be engaged, particularly the state agencies, on providing report outs on progress that is being made across state government, um, continuing a forum for public engagement, and providing updates on your own implementation across stakeholder groups and interests. So we want this to not only today, but continue being a forum for these project updates that adding perspective can be very helpful for. On advising, as we'll talk about today, uh, advising us as we're providing strategic direction for this effort. Also opportunities to increase effectiveness and efficiency of implementation. Um, as many of our presenters mentioned, we know technology will change over time, our solutions will cha change over time, and the regulatory landscape as well. So we want this group to continue directing and advising on how we maintain that flexibility. And we know that there are some conversations that need to continue, some information that should that needs to continue to be dispersed. So we need guidance from you all on where those conversations need to happen as well. And then on the side of leading, um, that you all would be leading uh, consistent, continuous, and innovative implementation in your own work. So not only when we're coming together, but that you all are leaders of implementation outside of this room, outside of quarterly meetings, um, that you all would lead in providing report outs as we turn to an all hands workshop uh, structure, which I'll go through in the next couple slides, that you all as task force members would be leaders um, in support of the climate action plan. So those are the, the main roles that we envision for you all, and I'll come back and open that up to questions as well. I wanted to turn our attention to the, all, the role of all hands. Um, as you all know, we have uh, 10 subgroups underneath the task force. There are four advisory groups and six sector committees, totaling nearly 150 stakeholders that supported uh, the task force in developing climate actions. But seeing that now our climate action plan, it reaches across our sector. So working in those silos isn't as beneficial as maybe it was to have narrow expertise in those groups when we were developing the action plan. So seeing the change in focus through that, the climate action plan, we also want our groups to be malleable with that. So we want to change the focus from these individual groups of all 10 of our subcommittees to having all hands workshops moving forward. And since we're moving away from this individual structure, there's also an opportunity to open the workshops just from our our designated stakeholders on those the public bodies before to expand um, to others in your organization and others who might be needed also at the table and implementation because some of those stakeholders might change. So um, the the CTF, so you all as the task force, is part of the all hands and part of your role would be leading uh, the work and the conversations with these other groups that we're working alongside of. So similar to the task force roles will look a little bit different as we move forward. And I propose three different roles that that can come to fruition. And so the first is collaboration, coordination, and advancement. 
So under collaboration, we want to encourage, we're bringing these stakeholder groups together in biannual workshops so that we're collaborating across, we're expanding our formal subgroup structure so that we can bridge these implementation gaps that exist now that have existed and that we want to keep from continuing in the future. We see there's a huge opportunity to forge new partnerships um, and want the all hands workshops to be an opportunity to do so. Um, from the, the middle perspective of coordination, that's moving forward from those meetings. We want to have collaborative meetings, but we want that to turn into coordination outside of formal meetings so that we're identifying and coordinating with appropriate members of um, other groups that might be wanting to or continuously um, doing work to execute action. And then advancement of action is similar to the role that you all have around advancing climate action, complex issues and innovation, in addition to and supplementing the public convenings that we'll have biannually. So these are meant to be a forum for collaboration to talk through um, the big issues that all of our stakeholders are working through and possibly the, the timelines that are set for us around legislative session, around changes in the administration, our, our annual reports with the climate action plan, um, having the all hands as a way to convene and, and work through and continue that collaboration, um, but certainly encouraging those partnerships outside of the formal structure as well. I'll provide an example of what that looks like through the upcoming March All Hands Workshop. So we, we do have a workshop calendared for March 23rd, I believe, in the morning. And this workshop uh, can serve a couple purposes we see. We first want to kick off with a presentation that brings everyone up to speed. I know it's been a long time since the subgroups of the task force have met. So providing a more in-depth review of what the climate action plan is uh, for all of our members and for members of the public that are able to attend. And then I envision that we can have um, a breakout uh, kind of led by a, a whiteboarding session where we'll have strategies of the climate action plan around the room and everyone can have sticky notes and sticky their name and their role in implementation under specific strategies. So we're starting to identify where stakeholders can work together who might not know the other is in the room or know that they even um, are working on that topic. So having that um, more individual time to talk to, to talk through, to read through actions, and then to provide that uh, level of commitment to working on advancing strategies. And then we'll have a breakout session where we probably won't break up by strategies, but possibly by uh, different topics of focus, such as uh, local and um, community engagement. We could have another breakout group by the Infrastructure uh, and Jobs Act in ways that we can break our all hands apart so that they're providing uh, different lenses of that are needed for implementation of the plan. So then we come back together, we'll do a report out by our breakout groups and then have an opportunity to walk around and meet others who are going to work on similar strategies um, that, that you all will and that others will as well and encouraging groups to meet outside of that all hands forum and we'll, we'll be bringing this group back together biannually to not only report out on progress but to, to continue changing and shaping those groups so that we're being exposed to a lot of different perspectives in that setting. So that is the, the intended approach for the March All Hands. I now want to just run through the next two slides of what the next 18, 22 months will look like and propose a path forward for you all that I'd like to open up to discussion. Um, but propose what these quarterly meetings of the task force and then the biannual workshops could look like in areas that we see are in needed focus for these different meetings over the next 22 months. So I've provided a timeline here. All the way on the left is the spring all hands, which I just walked through. The bolded key purpose of that is identifying and coordinating across implementers as we're jumping into this new phase of the climate action plan. And the task force's next quarterly meeting would be in the summer of 22. Um, we see that this could be progress reporting from agencies 
on scoping actions, a report out from the all hands and a report on legislative session. In the fall of 2022, we, we want to bring into discussion the annual report of the task force, a progress report from um, our, our all hands working groups and the IIJA as well, and have breakouts in that all hands meeting on annual report components when the task force would come back together in the winter of 2023. So as we turn into next year, that's when we would have our first annual report published and have some visioning um, set in that meeting on 2023. And what would that next year look like? Uh, possibly have a rollout for our legislative session strategy in 2023, a progress report on agency action and implementation as well. And then as we turn to the spring, this could be a combined task force and all hands meeting where we detail and strategize engagement in the 23 legislative session and put forward uh, some topics for discussion on agency action as well. And again, continuing to provide an update on in a forum for the IIJA report outs. Walking through the, the last couple months of the administration, um, in the summer of 2023, we envisioned that the task force could focus on what are next steps coming from the regular legislative session. And we're, we're hoping to continue just diving into the weeds more of what these actions look like over time. So by the time we get to the summer of um, 23, we'll have more detail as we're thinking about what these regulations and laws look like in practice. And in the fall of 2023, discussing administration changes, thinking through what do we want our indicators and our benchmarks to be in our next annual report. And then later on in the fall, having a group discussion on consistency across shifts in the administration, um, progress report outs on individual implementation uh, and breakouts from next steps on legislation. And then again, in winter of 2023, setting vision for 2024 and a new administration. So I know that's a lot of information on what the next 22 months could look like, but wanted to put forward this potential rhythm that we could have and the, a vision that we could have of what the task force's role will look like over the next set of months, um, tying together what that individually could be for the task force, as well as bringing back our all hands in our subgroups of the task force as well. And with that, I turn it back to the chair for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. I uh, appreciate you laying that out. Um, and really, this is our, our stab at what felt like a, a good balance of, of meetings, also incorporating the ongoing efforts, the existing coalitions that have been uh, you know, meeting independent of our advisory groups or committees. And so wanting to recognize that we want to expand the pie and implementation um, so that we're all coordinating with each other. And so that, that's really the intent of these, these all hands on meetings that are uh, you know, not just bringing in members of advisory groups and committees, but the general public as well, because uh, it is gonna require everybody to uh, throw in and coordinate amongst each other so you're, you know, people aren't getting invited to yeah, the same meeting on a given topic uh, by three different coalitions. Uh, perhaps we can serve to help uh, coordinate uh, across them. Uh, so, But uh, with that, I'll, I'll open up to questions because I know that was a lot to, to take in. And any recommendations as well on what else you would like to see from the task force meetings or from the all hands meetings? We're very open at this early mm -hmm. stage. Mr. Daniels. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a point. I think this looks great as a recommendation. I'll, we'll look some more at it. Um, I'll look some more at it to see just to make sure there aren't any major conflicts. Um, I think the legislative report outs and rollouts and those things are also really important and I just would love to maybe push a little bit that as the current session is rolling out I think um, I'm already seeing things that are going to undermine any future ability for us to accomplish this, the goals that we've set out in the cap so we probably need to pay closer attention in real time Mr. Chairman that may or may not mean that this is what this group does formally together mm -hmm. but I really want to encourage folks um, to pay attention to what's already being rolled out. 
um, much of it is designed to undermine the considerable work that's been put into this plan and we should acknowledge that thank you thank you mr. Daniels uh, certainly uh, we will be should all be tracking session and and you know, engaging in the, the committee's uh, hearings as well uh, dr. Calavota yeah um, thank you um, just a suggestion you know some some of the recommendations are continuous you know you're never really done mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. others are discrete where you there is a definitive end point to it such as fund the you know undertake this particular research mm -hmm. once that's funded and underway it may take three years to do the research but for the purposes of implementation you know that's to dawn so I would suggest that you come up with some kind of a reporting form and I think that's important from an implementation standpoint to say you know after the first two years you know 20 of the items are considered implemented because they're fully funded they're underway and you know there's no stopping them at that point so that that I think builds momentum that's a great idea so. thank you yeah, great great point dr. Calavota um, certainly yeah we want to be able measuring and breaking it down in a you know digestible uh, mm -hmm. way because there's a lot in, in this climate action plan so thank you uh, any other questions at this point um, you know, we'll certainly be flexible and can add in you know uh, agenda items or you know a, as we go and as needs arise and as this this body uh, deems appropriate so um, we'll not feel like we're locked in uh, to this proposal but we wanted to give you an idea to, to kind of level set and set expectations so we're all kind of on the same page mm -hmm. all right thank you very much and uh -huh. I think you're continuing on or do you have a is that your at the end of your presentation I, I yes. will. Oh, gotcha. There we go. <laughs> uh, something for for this this task force yes. and this body Thank to uh, discuss. Um, you know, we've heard a lot from from various members uh, and uh, our guests as well. But we wanted to ask this question of our task force members to get a, a conversation started: Is how have and can you advance implementation through your communities, your networks? Uh, I'll expand it to your organizations. Um, and what are some ideas that, that you're, you're already thinking about? Um, and I will just recommend in kind of the interest of time and orderly conduct, uh, maybe we'll just go down the row and, and give everybody an opportunity to speak. And so well, let's, let's start with you, Dr. Chambers, and then we'll kind of run through this top row and then go to the bottom row. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, this truly, as the governor mentioned, that we have a truly generational opportunity to funding opportunity with the bar bipartisan infrastructure law for us to seek external funding to try to implement many of the uh, actions strategies and actions that we've recommended in the uh, in the climate action plan I don't think we're going to have as good an opportunity to begin to implement as right now but it will require a lot of work really quickly to get ready for us to get ready to submit very competitive proposals uh, lots of proposals I'm not talking about two or three we need to be submitting a bunch of proposals uh, the the there is a summary document that Mitch Landry Landrew put together with like a one pager on every uh, program that collection of one pagers is over 500 pages long <laughs> okay and so <clears throat> we we need to be I believe that we need to be preparing right now to go after these funding opportunities very aggressively and I think we could work together and with the public uh, to do those kinds of things and because I represent the academic community on this task force I would like to say that the Louisiana's institutions of higher education stand ready to help with that effort uh, especially the research universities we write proposals for a living almost and we're very skilled at it so we would like to uh, to offer our help in in doing that thank you thank you dr. chambers uh, hope you bring the 
the party to the all hands on deck meeting. Um, uh, Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just offer a, a couple thoughts and, and I'm not sure that it's kind of different from what we have been doing. Uh, and so I guess the first point that I would make is that there's considerable collaboration that's going on among state agencies in this energy transition space. Uh, I know over the last uh, two years of the pandemic and everything else, uh, I've been on numerous uh, virtual presentations or in-person pres in presentations with Secretary Harris and members of his staff, uh, the Governor's Office of Coastal Activities, uh, pretty much to the point that I think each of us could give each other's presentations that we've heard them so many times among ourselves. And so there's a lot of existing collaboration that's going on among state agencies to try to achieve these goals and and take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of Louisiana in this energy transition space. And it's not just among state agencies. Uh, for instance, when Secretary Harris and his team, we were in Washington in late January, we spent a decent amount of time with the U.S. Department of Energy's loan programs office, which has a considerable amount of those billions of dollars to uh, get in, get into the com get into the system, and and uh, choose projects that they believe can achieve clean energy goals. I've had a follow up with the loan programs office. Yesterday, I was on a call with. Uh, the assistant administrator of NOAA. Again, NOAA's playing a role, as Ms. Matthews said, in the offshore wind piece. So we are also seeking relationship building with our federal partners to try to position the state, again, to take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of us, both on the reduction of emissions as well as the continuation of economic opportunities for our workers and for our businesses and that's really kind of what, what we're focused on and what I see we will continue to do uh, because we believe in it <laughs> and, and as long as as long as we're in the chairs that we're in uh, the task before us is to try to win for Louisiana and I think that's what we're focused on so thank you mr. chair thank you mr. Lambert Dr. Burkett. Yes. Um, the Science Advisory Group co-chairs um, Dr. Mark Zappi at University of Louisiana Lafayette and I met with Harry, uh, Mr. Warhoff, <laughs> about two weeks ago, and we talked about the role of science as the plan unfolds. And we've heard all this exciting information about these new opportunities, and, but we don't want to get sidetracked from the fact that we need science to support things like CCUS, assessments, that sort of thing, that um, haven't been mentioned today because we have these wonderful, exciting opportunities. And gosh, I didn't expect to come here and hear all this good news about things that are already underway. And even from the abandoned, the orphaned well program, mm -hmm. coupled with the BOEM and all the other, uh, it's just portends progress that I don't think any of us could have envisioned two years ago. You know, I mean, it's amazing. I love what the governor said, you know, about, you know, we could have picked it to part to death and never gotten anywhere. And instead, we stepped out with a vision. And uh, to achieve the vision, we, we do need science that would support uh, and answer questions and underpin decision making. And so we have thought about splitting up the science advisory group to help answer the priority questions that will be coming out of the various sectors that may kind of work together or across the, the task force uh, more so than in the past. We thought about uh, forming some consortia or specific groups that uh, could do things like work with the Water Institute on the EPS tool, the greenhouse gas inventory, um, protecting and enhancing natural carbon storage. We haven't talked about those sorts of things, but those are big pieces and cornerstones of the plan. The wetland carbon, uh, you know, just keeping the momentum of that information that will underpin the various aspects of that. So I hope uh, 
that Ms. Cooper, when we organize the, the all hands meeting, one of the outcomes of that, I hope, will be to start identifying the priority information needs that will get us towards the strategies and the actions. And that will help us design the committees or the, the or work with uh, cooperators and consortia that at universities, for example, to answer the questions. So if we can keep that as one of the outcomes, that will help help us a lot. But, and we're just, uh, Dr. Zappi and I kind of stand by for your guidance on next steps, but hopefully that would be one. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Burkett, appreciate that. Mr. Moses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> and, and I echo so much of what's already been said. It, it's just, uh, been a great a, a great effort on everyone's part and I think we've all not all but many silos that I think in the next steps are to bring these bring these together um, you know what can we do now to start implementation it's, it's hard to get out of those silos and be able to implement things but but using our networks that we already have I think we have some opportunities maybe to advance some, in, in some areas considering the various expertise of, of so many different individuals here um, you know for, for instance I think we do need to very closely monitor the legislation that that's been proposed this year and work with the stakeholders to to um, that's something that's a more immediate that we can start start moving forward with um, and advancing in, in some of those networks and and you know there are things about you know building codes and things like that the built environment the land use I think we can start making some headway uh, in dealing with our stakeholders on, on those areas. So we'll be glad to continue to work and I know eventually get out of these silos and bring it all together. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Uh, Secretary Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I think with what we're really trying to accomplish, I don't know if we're ever going to reach a point when we can say that we're done. Uh, although uh, I appreciate the uh, uh, Dr. Calavota's uh, uh, ideas because it's, I think it's important to acknowledge when we've uh, accomplished certain aspects or certain uh, goals or priorities so we can check those off the list and focus our resource elsewhere where it's needed. You know, in the bigger picture of, of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and minimizing the impact of, of, of climate change. I think the best we can ever hope to do is, uh, you know, achieve some fuzzy level of green, blue, or gray uh, success. Uh, but the work is important, and, and uh, uh, I appreciate what everyone on this group is doing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Secretary Harris. Uh, I will just, you've already heard uh, what the governor's office is, is doing, so uh, I won't belabor those points, but uh, I will just say that, you know, one of our objectives is, is, as we look towards implementation is, is setting up those systems, frameworks, coalitions that will, you know, really snowball beyond this administration and the end of, of Governor Edwards' term. And because, you know, this is a, a, a plan that looks three decades out. Um, and so this this is not on one governor's or one administration or or even you know any of our individual shoulders or collective shoulders. It, it is way bigger than that. And so the the commitment to really uh, strengthening these uh, uh, ties with external partners, I think, is something that we're uh, we're really looking to do in the in the near term. Uh, so it'll continue on. But with that, uh, Dr. Calavota. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of our partners in all this has to be the private sector so we're going to have to reach out and establish relationships and um, you know I give you an example on EV charging stations infrastructure you know it's going to be DNR DOTD and DEQ going to be working on that together but our concept is to have a grant program where the private sector installs all these things because we we don't want to own them <laughs> I don't want to own them, maintain them, or try to collect money from them. You know, that really needs to be a private sector issue. So in developing a grant program, we're going to have to reach out to the private sector about, you know, what, how does that grant program need to be structured and things like that. And so those kind of um, uh, relationships are going to have to be developed, and a lot of it is going to come from the private sector. Some of it's going to come from local governments, our conversion of public 
uh, the public fleet to alternative fuels, it's not just conversion of the state fleet, it's conversion of the public fleet, which includes parishes, cities, levy districts, all these different entities. So there's going to be um, a lot of coordination required for that as well, I think. so. Thank you, Dr. Calavota. Ms. Higgins. Yes, I, I really appreciate all the, the comments I've been hearing as we go around the table, and uh, it's interesting to, um, again, just recognize the individual contributions that everyone one makes to the collective whole here. I think uh, similarly uh, from DEQ's perspective and, and those action items that uh, for which DEQ would be one of the implementers, it, it will require you know, critical collaboration from the industrial sector, from the power sector, and with our state agency partners, um, as well as continued support. I, I was very interested to hear Dr. Burkett focusing on what information would be needed. Um, one of the actions that we will need to undertake for a number of the strategies would be rulemaking, and to start to identify how and where rules would be needed. Um, you know, the, the plan has uh, some wonderful opportunities for pilot projects and for incentivizing um, greenhouse gas reductions through a number of mechanisms, but um, ultimately the plan also included um, strategies and action items to actually establish standards both within the power sector, the oil and gas sector, in the industrial sector. Um, those rules certainly, um, I mean, I, I think in terms of schedules and laying out a regulatory rulemaking schedule that provides for ample time for input from all of the stakeholders, um, that allows us to take into consideration the information provided on the science side on how to support the economy and, and how to build equity into that equation as well. So a lot of work to be done there. We're looking forward to you know, working uh, collectively with everyone to try to accomplish that. I think there's still a lot of work to be done to identify the specific actions that we will need to implement the strategies in the plan. Thank you, Ms. Higgins. Ms. Gotro. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I haven't heard anything I don't wholeheartedly agree with, so I'll just add on from the the Nature Conservancy's perspective, um, I've held this work of the Climate Task Force up, and there is incredible enthusiasm within our organization, which even at a national level tries to address policy issues related to emissions reduction and, of course, natural climate solutions, nature-based solutions. So we're committed to the extent we can influence how spending moves forward to down to implementing projects. We look forward to working with our public-private partners in doing that and we're looking specifically um, both near term in terms of uh, again the dedicated conservation funding which we believe is going to be an important opportunity to uh, in conservation to better allow both our natural resources as well as uh, the economy of our state to move forward in a productive manner and be able to address the impacts of climate change into the future and one of the things that um, and I know my co-chair is here is going to have an opportunity to, to comment as well. I think it's going to be very important as reference that this is a spot in time, but we need to be thinking about long terms in terms of migration of habitats and how we're going to address that in the future with the natural resources and um, other implications associated with that. So again, we look forward to, to working in a collaborative manner across stakeholders to uh, bring our expertise to bear in implementing the components of the action plan uh, that we can directly support, but are happy to look across the spectrum with other things that nor or naturally are normally in our uh, agenda because it's all very connected as we appreciate and we want to support the action plan however we can. Thank you, Ms. Gotro. Ms. Bush. Great, thank you. Um, well, I appreciate the comments about the private sector that were made earlier. I think I may be the last member of the private sector standing today, if not one of the last. <laughs> so I can only speak on behalf of BHP. Um, but, you know, as a partner in the communities where we operate, we understand that we share stewardship of the environment 
support local cultures and help drive economic development. At BHP, we view our management of sustainability as core to our efforts to generate what we term social value. Uh, to ensure we consider social value in our business decision making, it's actually built into our metrics and is embedded uh, into our annual planning process. It's a requirement that we take every year. Uh, part of that includes a commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we recognize that we can contribute to these goals related to poverty, inequality, climate change, conservation, and economic growth. Sound familiar, right? <laughs> in working uh, in partnership with many different stakeholders, such as those represented on the task force. And that's actually why I'm here today. Um, so as we look at the, the, the plan and the recommendations in the climate uh, action plan, so many of the recommendations align directly with the sustainable development goals. Um, BHP is already working in this space and we're keen to tie existing and new business efforts to the plan in order to help Louisiana meet its goals. Uh, we recognize that the interconnectedness of the recommendations means that a positive contribution can have a multiplier effect. So we work to understand the linkages, manage and mitigate our impacts, and determine how we can make a positive contribution to those most relevant to our business and social value priorities. So with that said, you know, we continue to review and consider the recommendations of the plan as we develop our business plans. We're actually in that, that cycle right now. Um, so uh, specific to the state of Louisiana, we look forward to contributing directly to the achievement of the plan's goals through both direct implementation efforts, advocacy, and partnership with our stakeholders. Thank you very much, Ms. Bush. Um, Mr. Haas. Oh, sorry. Well, all right. You're good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so at the risk of stating the, the obvious, uh, obviously first and foremost in my mind is to continue to implement our, our coastal program uh, and all of the things that it does to support to support this plan. So that that's obviously a no brainer and, and I'm uh, certainly biased there. But I did want to just touch on something that really resonated with me that the governor mentioned and, and Ms. Bush actually just alluded to and that's the amount of common ground that's uh, part of this plan and, and the need for us to find our successes in that large space uh, of common ground here so that we can continue to maintain the the momentum that's built appears to be building uh in the near future and um and to keep that going um well into the future so um i'll keep my remarks short that's all i'll i'll uh, i'll say but uh, appreciate the opportunity mr chair thank you very much mr haas Ms. Broom. Great. Thank you so much. Um, well, as I stated earlier, uh, the Center for Planning Excellence is already partnering to move forward actions 12.1 and 12.5, and will continue to support the state in its um, putting its foot forward on, on the um, bipartisan infrastructure bill. But I will tell you that um, I think we should all have this on our desk. Uh, we should all be using it to write our grants, to write applications, um, using it as a guide in all of our work, uh, lifting it up. And I would also submit to um, the task force that uh, maybe, maybe we could be used a little differently. So when um, some of our state partners are putting forth some of their applications or uh, initiatives in the, uh, in the plan, uh, use us as a, a sounding board to help think through, um, you know, uh, what what that looks like, what that approach looks like. Uh, instead of, you know, if if the task force is is just brought together periodically uh, for report outs, uh, we might not have as much attendance. But if if we're able to have and provide meaningful input uh, into how this moves forward, I think there there's going to be a lot more energy around it. And so um, I just wanted to offer. Um, I hope everyone knows uh, you have my full support, the, the backing of the Center for Planning Excellence, and um, I'm really excited to, to use this as, a, um, as kind of our, our North Star and guide uh, moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Manning Broom. Uh, great points. All right. Not, last but not least, Mr. Bro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree entirely with using this, all this work, as a guide for how to approach the infrastructure bill, and it's exactly what I'm gonna do. Strategy 16, every action in there. Uh, there was a lot of turning and twisting and hair pulling on my part and my, my compatriots and co-chair that went into that. And I see each one of those things blossomed into an outline that I intend to present or, or on behalf of partners uh, with some academic inputs. I will be looking for a lot of that. 
And since um, <coughs> all the discussion that has started regarding uh, opportunities through the infrastructure bill and lack of guidance regarding uh, which angle you're looking at it through, um, there's been a lot of attention given this, where while it was being developed, sometimes it was hard to keep people at the table. There's the infrastructure bill, it's getting real now. And everything that the people I work with, uh, that they do on the land, or try to encourage to get done on the land in the name of conservation, since prior to the advent of the 85 Farm Bill, our conservation districts every year have locally led conservation meetings. It's nothing but a stakeholder meeting. Talking about grassroots, to me, it doesn't get any better than that. People, the public, anybody who's interested uh, comes to the table with their conservation concerns. More and more things are leaning this way and everything that we've been steered by uh, public input to do in the name of water quality, soil health, watershed management, uh, hypoxia reduction, it's all here. It, it's more than a collateral benefit it's becoming the focus, and uh, I think we've got some really big opportunities ahead of us. And I'm grateful for AG to be have an opportunity to be part of that. We are grateful as well, and uh, thank you all for your comments and input and, and ideas. And uh, the exciting thing is we have another meeting at the end of the month, so uh, more to come. Uh, and with that, uh, we will move to public comment. Uh, I have one card. Uh, please, if anybody has any additional com comments, please uh, bring them forward. Um, but uh, Ms. Logan Burke, uh, please come up to the table and offer your comment. Thank you, and I hope you, you don't mind if I read. <laughs> um, so I'm Logan Burke. I'm with the Alliance for Affordable Energy. Um, we've known for some time that any delay in real emissions reductions puts our homes and our way of life at risk. And on February 28th of this year, the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change really highlighted for us what is in store for our coast and for our people. I am encouraged today to hear about the efforts underway, especially around the equity metrics um, and offshore wind and addressing methane emissions from orphaned and abandoned wells. I want to urge the governor's office and this task force to continue with this momentum, including supporting bills this legislative session that are aligned with, this ta with the climate actions in this cap that will make communities cleaner and more resilient right away in the face of a cl changing climate and as Mr. Daniels mentioned, oppose the bills that would undermine these goals. Finally, um, I urge this group and anyone listening to resist the messaging from industries that are taking the war in Ukraine as an opportunity to push more fossil fuel investments, which would reverse the good work happening here. Even some of the announced hydrogen projects in our state are really just doubling down on fossil fuels, and a hasty effort to build out new fossil infrastructure mustn't be believed as a solution to short-term price volatility, as no new pipelines or facilities could come overnight and would simply cement our old relationships with oil and gas, even as we need to walk away from them. Any new investments in oil and gas not only backs our state and country further into a climate corner, it makes our economy less stable and Louisianans less safe. Let's keep moving on the kinds of projects discussed here today, not on false promises. Let's get rolling on technologies that are ready now to protect, train, and employ our people. And let's position Louisiana to receive federal support for this transition. Now is the time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Uh, I believe we have two or a couple uh, emailed comments as well. Yes. So the first uh, emailed comment is from Angel Bradford with the um, Sierra Club Delta chapter. Uh, and it says, Dear Honorable Members of the CITF and all leaders and guests, the members of the transit equity team of the Delta chapter of the Sierra Club speak out today to express both hope but also concern regarding the influx of funding flowing from the federal levels and often not fully accounted for once it re reaches the state level. 
The Delta chapter is the Louisiana chapter of the Sierra Club, the nation's oldest grassroots environmental organization, and has been working for over 50 years to ensure the conservation of land, air, and water, while also, while also sounding the alarm on the urgent steps we must all make to save this planet. The Georgetown Climate Center found that the IIJA could increase greenhouse gas emissions if the money is spent on expanding highways instead of other more sustainable uses like public transit. Thus, it is important to be clear about the ways in which the money could be used versus how current plans ensure it will be used. Per our transit team's own interactions and meetings, it is obvious that Louisiana does not plan to maximize the opportunities for public transit. This is evident in the highway priority program and statewide transportation plans that center cars over transit consistently. It is also evident in our state's attempt to address the $14 billion infrastructure backlog, which does not include the additional billions for new projects. Today we ask that the members of the CITF work to ensure and encourage the state of Louisiana and Department of Transportation and Development to lead with greater transparency as it pertains to any mega projects moving forward that impact the climate and the people of Louisiana, which in our view is all projects. The DOTD website is outdated and hard to follow, and in the spirit of the governor's budget, that included the recommendation of a website to give the public the power to see how the federal funds are used, whether ARP, CARES, or BIF slash IIJA. We ask that DOTD invest in upgrading its website to more clearly grade project uh, impacts on environment and clarify the stage and next steps for each given project in a language that everyday folks like us can understand. We also are encouraging and asking legislators to allocate any excess funds for infrastructure towards fix-it-first maintenance over new allocations for new projects. The I-49 and proposed Lafayette, Lake Charles, and Baton Rouge bridges projects communities have consistently spoken out against for years and that are discouraged by the Buttigieg administration are examples of projects that could use both economically and environmentally sustainable alternatives. Today, we'd also like to uplift a specific example and concern, the rail between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, as well as proposed rail lines between Dallas and Atlanta by way of Shreveport and Monroe. While we understand that the Kansas City Southern and Canadian Pacific merger has yet to be approved by the Surface Transportation Board, we are vastly disappointed by local media reporting that has been misleading regarding the status of these rail projects, particularly the BR to NOLA route. For the powers that be who have influence, uh, please know that we are not asking just for a rail. We want Louisiana to consider Louisiana-owned and or operated electrified rail systems that are modern, beautiful, and most importantly, safe and passenger dedicated. To invest in any more diesel projects at this juncture in time would be irresponsible, and Louisiana citizens do not need to be further bound by oil and gas 20 to 50 years down the road. We ask that projects like the one just highlighted take priority, as we know that DOTD has not taken the necessary steps to see passenger rail return to Louisiana. Yes, it is a bold ask for administration that will be different in less than two years, but, but no less. If we actually are committed to saving this planet, it must be done, and we need to get started now. Our chapter has asked KCS and CP representatives that they make more robust efforts to directly engage us, volunteers and members of the community, and other community organizations and residents beyond that of the business communities and chambers of commerce. More specifically, we would like to see frequent and equitably timed open houses across the state, particularly in areas of the state that are most likely to see the reinstatement of passenger rail lines in the near future. Additionally, there are no clear, reliable modes of communication regarding the KCS-CP merger, whether via website or updates via local media. And the timeline for the institution of proposed projects within Louisiana are lacking detail. As it pertains to the public good, we aim to see that the public transit is affordable, frequent, safe, and a civil right for all. It is, a vital, it is vital that city planning, affordable housing, and the climate are centered in decision-making processes. We ask that any rail companies are required to make climate commitments that meet the standards of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's recommendations. We ask that all rail companies, owners, and operators in Louisiana are required to make tangible, public-facing commitments to electrification of routes, old and new. And while the movement of people and commerce and goods are ideal for the planet uh, when executed via rail, rail that is electric, not diesel, is maximally good for us all. Investments uh, now and into the future should be grounded in this reality. The last thing our state needs is another avenue for the proliferation of carbon emissions, particulate matter, and pollution in our towns and cities. And if federal funds, uh, both surplus funds intended to address COVID-related matters and IIJA, are going to be used to worsen the climate, then we would rather you leave the competitive grants right where they are and route the funds that have already been allocated to some other issues where good can be done. Thank you for your time and consideration and the opportunity to comment. Um, and the second is uh, from Kendall Dix with the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy. And it begins, uh, 
Dear GOKA staff, apologies for not being able to attend today's meeting in person, but please accept these comments on behalf of Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy. Now that the Climate Action Report has officially been released, it's time to turn to implementation. We have a tremendous opportunity to advance equity and bring prosperity to the people of Louisiana, but the order in which we implement each action is important, and we must avoid false solutions that rely on fossil fuels, the cause of the climate crisis that is harming and displacing our people. We call on the legislature, the governor, and his agencies, and the Public Service Commission to support and advance the following actions. Stop emissions. In order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change and reduce our reliance on authoritarian states, we have to stop extracting and burning coal, oil, and natural gas. This means we have to get our energy from natural sources such as the sun, wind, and water. First things first. Investing in renewable energy is the most important first step because all other climate actions will make the problem worse if we have to use fossil fuels to make them happen. This is particularly true of energy-intensive processes such as green hydrogen. Disaster resilience. Energy, like solar, can work even after a hurricane. Justly sourced renewable energy can help us adapt to climate disasters. Housing. To reduce emissions, we can insulate homes and put solar panels on roofs. This will also make uh, lower people's electricity bills and make their homes more hurricane resilient. Transportation. By increasing public transportation and electrifying our buses and trains, we can help people who can't afford cars and also encourage people with cars to drive less. Stopping harm. Louisiana's residents are exposed to toxic chemicals from industri industrial facilities and other oil and gas infrastructure. By reducing industrial production, we can clean up our air, water, and soil. Equitable implementation. The people who should first benefit from these programs are those who have suffered historic harm, such as indigenous land theft and slavery and poor people who are excluded from the benefits of the oil and gas economy. We are dismayed by the news that Louisiana continues to pursue false solutions, such as blue hydrogen. Climate change is caused by the extraction, refinement, and burning of fossil fuels, and natural gas in all of its forms uh, is a fossil fuel. Methane, one of the most common forms of natural gas, is itself a potent greenhouse gas if released into the atmosphere, and burning it also releases greenhouse gases. Blue and gray hydrogen are derived from methane and are therefore false climate solutions. As a reminder, a recent study from Stanford and Cornell found that blue hydrogen is worse for the climate than coal. In addition to greenhouse gas emissions, natural gas produces a number of serious environmental harms, including air pollution, water pollution, and earthquakes. Fracking and other harmful processes associated with natural gas are concentrated in poor communities, which are disproportionately black, indigenous, and people of color. Natural gas production and blue hydrogen are therefore incompatible with this task force's commitments to equity. We won't go into detail on every concern about carbon capture storage since we have already heard from so many reputable scientists at our previous meeting that it is a costly and energy intensive solution that will destroy our coast and lock in toxic infrastructure in environmental justice communities. But we will call attention to the recent report that a prominent blue hydrogen uh, plant built by Shell is emitting more greenhouse gases than it is capturing because carbon capture, capture simply does not work yet. This was backed up by the Government Accountability Office's report, which found that $1.1 billion in carbon capture subsidies was largely wasted. The recent IPCC report affirmed what we have known for years. Climate change is already here, and it's getting worse. We must stop the harm and adapt for the future, but on the only way out of this mess is to stop repeating the mistakes of the past and instead embrace equitable solutions. Our people and culture depend on it. And there's a PS. In order to know whether our plan is being implemented equitably, we must measure our progress with concrete material metrics. We call on the CITF to regularly report on key equity metrics, which we would like to work with you all on. And that is the extent of our public comments on the email. Thank you very much. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So we have a motion by Mr. Bro, second by Mr. Haas. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, y'all.